liturgy was what got me to Catholicism. Liturgy blew my mind. I went like, this is the historic practice of the church. This is, uh, this is beautiful, so organized, so, so biblical as well. I just love the Bible. So I started seeing things uh, in mass that were from the Bible. I'm like, wow, okay, wow, the readings, the, the, the echoes of Leviticus there, the echoes of Exodus, the, the, the Passover. Oh, it, it was the a revelation how it also plays in. Amazing, amazing. Throughout my reading, I was starting to read the Reformers again, but at the same time, I also found uh, Dr. Jordan Cooper on YouTube, and I, re I then I found which something that I had missed for forever, and that was liturgical Protestantism. <laughs> Welcome back to the channel, everybody. My name is Javier Perdomo, and this channel is a place where I like to do uh, church history videos, theology videos, apologetics videos, and in particular, where I like to do uh, quote-unquote Protestant apologetics, insofar as Protestantism is an umbrella category. But what I really mean by that is exploring uh, the traditions that exist within that umbrella, right? The same way that Roman Catholicism is a particular tradition, Presbyterianism is a tradition, uh, Lutheranism is a tradition, Anglicanism, uh, as is relevant for today's video, is a tradition. Um, Protestantism is an umbrella, the same way that uh, what we would call ecclesialism, uh, as, a, as an example title, would be an umbrella for maybe the Church of the East, the Roman Catholic Church, the of a contest, and uh, the old Catholics, and so on and so forth. And so, as you guys know, if you're fans of the channel, or if you're not, well, if you're not uh, a longtime fan of the channel, you're new here, welcome. Uh, but for those of you that have been here, you know that I like to platform stories from people that either have converted from Roman Catholicism to a Protestant tradition, from people that have done the same by, from the East, uh, or people that almost became an Eastern or almost became Eastern Orthodox, almost became Roman Catholic, but then ended up not doing so and is happily Protestant. And so today uh, with us, we have Eddie Rodriguez. Eddie has a bachelor's degree in history with a minor in political science from the Pontifical Catholic University of Puerto Rico, a master's degree in history from Liberty University, and he's currently preparing to start his master's degree in philosophy at Biola University with the hope of getting a doctorate in systematic theology. How are you doing, Eddie? Doing well, you know, when I hear all those things, I, I, I sort of feel squeamish going like, oh, uh, did I do all that? Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you the same question I asked uh, Dr. Schultz. In my interview. It's like, man, where do you find the time for, <laughs> for all these degrees? <laughs> oh, and, 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 I'm, and I'm married. I have a daughter. Like, if you, it, this, it looks semi nice in the background, but if you see on the floor, there's a bunch of toys. And usually, and usually the, the, these uh, bookshelves have, uh, I have some panels that I just, uh, I do a, a little doohickey thing where I just block them so my daughter can play. And so, pull the books yeah. out. And, and I also am a teacher, so it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Before we uh, get started with your story, do you want to share a little bit about that and tell us a little bit about how long you've been teaching and oh, yeah. what you've been teaching? Sure. Um, I teach in Florida. I am a Florida teacher. Uh, I teach social studies. And I've been teaching uh, seventh and eighth grade. I've been teaching civics, uh, U.S. history, almost for 10 years now. So it's been a really interesting journey. I've been, yes, pray for me. Pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's never yeah. easy, and teachers uh, work really hard. So um, if you see a teacher, hug them. Buy them a coffee, yeah. something. <laughs> no, I believe I, I had the other day um, for the first time in a while because most of my work, uh, even when I when I was serving as an associate pastor at my old church, most of my work has always been with the youth. And so I I, I preached sermons when in, in, in that church when our senior pastor was on vacation or was sick, but mainly my work is with the youth, and I love the youth. But man, like a week ago, I had the chance at, at our uh, young adults like small group to lead that. Oh boy, is it a, a different Things experience? Have Things, Things have changed. Things have changed. I love the youth. Don't get me wrong, but oh man, everyone was like, "Yeah, let's share about like." You know, people had already read the text prior. Like people were sharing. Oh man, it was great. <laughs> it, it, the, working with kids, it, and this is something that uh, I. I if I if I eventually uh, become a pastor, which is something that I've, that I've been thinking about, 
but you know, discerning, still praying, still seeing if that's the correct way. If not, it might be just being a teacher. It, it, it's getting to understand that these concepts that we're going to be talking about, um, needs, sometimes we like elevating them and we elevate them. And don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's necessary to get, uh, clarification and, and correct language. The reason why we have philosophy in general is, is so we can narrow down and define things so nice and perfectly, like, you know, the Athanasian Creed and things like that. So we get it, but at the same time, lay people don't, don't get a lot of these things and, and they get confused. So it's sometimes nice taking these things and breaking them down to something a little bit more where somebody can understand, go, well, give me the meat and potatoes of this thing. You know how it is. <laughs> well, and I feel like, and when someone is like, hey, give me the meat and potatoes, then, well, at least we've done the first part of our job right, because we distilled it down. They understood it <laughs> to the point where they want the meat and potatoes. So, so something's gone right. <laughs> <Yep. know? laughs> but, all right, well, Eddie, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get out of your way here so you can tell your story uh, as to how you, uh, you know, came Roman Catholic and how you ended up. Uh, where you are now, uh, sure a happy member of the Anglican Church. And so I'm going to subtract myself here and just let you get to it. So before I begin, I'm going to do a quick little uh, prayer. And this is just for myself. It's from the uh, 1662 Book of Common Prayer. O God, by whom the meek are guided in judgment and light riseth up in darkness for the godly, grant us in all our doubts and uncertainties the grace to ask what you, thou wouldest have us to do, that the spirit of wisdom may save us from all false choices, and that in thy light we may see light, and in thy straight path may not stumble through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So um, I just wanted to always start with a prayer. It's just something that I've learned in my life as an Anglican. But um, going back to my story, I grew up in, in Puerto Rico, um, and I grew up in a, I, some people would imagine you grow up in Puerto Rico, well, you are going to be Catholic. Well, there's a strong, especially after the United States uh, came in, there's a strong Protestant, uh, many churches, uh, strong Protestant presence there, almost 50-50 at this point. So I grew up in a, uh, in a Protestant uh, denomination. I grew up in a Baptist church. Um, throughout all my teenage years, I was very involved from the beginning. I, my grandmother uh, was a cradle Pentecostal, and she read to me the Bible, not Bible stories, the Bible. She had me as a baby, and she would just read me the Bible, and I just soaked it in, apparently, because I just fell in love with the Bible. And since I was a kid, I read the Bible over and over again. So... Um, as I kept going in my journey throughout uh, my childhood and my teenage years, I get involved in church leadership in that Baptist uh, church. Great people there. Um, eventually, I, I end up teaching, just like 13 or 14 years old, and I'm teaching kids uh, about the Bible. So it's really... I think it was a wrong decision that they made, but it was an experience for me and just getting to know, uh, I'm, I come from a family of teachers, so just getting to know the Lord's word and how to teach it to people from that early age was very interesting for me. Um, I also got involved with a with a ministry called True Love Waits, which is basically, you know, about sexual pur purity and not uh, getting, uh, not getting, uh, involved in 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 fornication and things like that just saving yourself for marriage um well afterwards i leave uh i leave that church because of some drama that happened i don't want to get into it because it's not important for this story um it's drama happens everywhere and as I left that church, I went to a non-denominational church, which had a more Arminian uh, theolo theology per se, and, you know, felt right at home. Again, really nice people, really devoted people, and eventually I ended up uh, joining their leadership in the, in the youth group. Um, as I... As I kept going, by that time when I joined the non-denominational church, I had uh, 
I had gone to college and in that pontifical Catholic university. And even though it was a, a Catholic university, there were Protestant groups, there were atheist groups like any other college. And we had debates about Bible, about God. We had all those debates. So I immersed myself in a rudimentary apologetics, um, more specifically about the existence of God. And um, as I kept going, I started listening to my Catholic uh, uh, brothers as they were debating, and I and I and I and I heard things that that talked to me. You know, the the logic, the academia, these things that that I didn't see in 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 my non denominational and even in the Baptist Church too. I didn't see that intellectual side. So uh, it, it eventually I start studying a little bit uh, of Roman Catholicism. And as I studied it, it was, it was a fascinating journey because I, I, I started thinking to myself, why didn't I see this before? Because I grew up with these myths about uh, Catholicism, these myths about the, the, the great whore of Babylon and all these uh, caricatures of what Rome was, which is never good. You never want to uh, know something based on the caricature. You actually want to experience it uh, and, and know it per se. I'll correct that. It's not so much <laughs> experiencing it necessarily, but knowing it authentically. Um, so as I started getting involved, um, the structure blew my mind as well. I, this is an organized church. This is an all-encompassing church. This is a global church. And I, went, I, I, and I thought to myself, well, this is it. The, the kingdom of God is everywhere. It's all over the world. And I started studying liturgy, and that's what convinced me. Liturgy was the one thing that convinced me. Not, it's interesting that for somebody who was studying history, history was not the main thing that got me to Protestantism. Liturgy was. Sorry, to got me to Catholicism. Liturgy was what got me to Catholicism. Liturgy blew my mind. I went like, this is the historic practice of the church. This is, uh, this is beautiful, so organized, so, so biblical as well. So I just love the Bible. So I started seeing things uh, in mass that were from the Bible. I was like, wow, okay, wow, the readings, the, the, the echoes of Leviticus there, the echoes of Exodus, the, the, the Passover. Oh, it, it was the a revelation, how it also plays in. Amazing, amazing. So I did fall in love with it, but at the same time, and this is something that I only recently learned about this term because well, I didn't know it, it's deconstruction. I started basically a deconstruction of my evangelical faith. And even though it ended, I, I had a pit stop in Catholicism, I ended up just leaving Christianity altogether eventually. Why? Multiple reasons, but one of them, as I look back, I, if, I, if you would have asked me that, you know, in all honesty, I would not have said this. This is just looking back. Um, I, I just had a major interest in living a hedonistic lifestyle. I wanted a life of leisure and pleasure. I want to have, have fun. I wanted to go out on dates and... I wanted it all, and I did. I did. So, in many ways, even though I there was, I used atheist, rigorous um, arguments for my side of things. I just said, "Well, no, no." So it, this is because of intellectual, blah 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 blah. No, no, it was, and I get, and I'm telling you right now, humbly and in all humility. It was because I was looking for pleasurable, a pleasurable and sinful lifestyle. That's it. And 
I lived my final years in college like that. And um, when I was 24, around uh, 2015, I uh, got a call to work in Florida. And I moved to Florida, as all Puerto Ricans do. <laughs> and uh, I, I started uh, teaching here. And as I was teaching here, things started to unravel a little bit. Uh, I, I met who would eventually be uh, my wife. Um, and I, the, 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 the lifestyle didn't attract me anymore, although I still kept some things, and we'll talk, I want to talk about that in a moment. But the, the hedonism was not enough anymore. And as I had lived three, four years in, in all this swamp and dirtiness and destruction, destruction, just the destructive lifestyle. And I said to myself, I, and I, I was seeing the news, I was seeing all the, all the dis, just sin, the, the ugliness uh, of everything, everything was being deconstructed, the postmodernist uh, way of looking at things that truth is relative and all of that. I will have I, there was such a culture culture shock for me that I I, um, I I said to myself, "Lord, where are you?" And I said to, and that's the moment I realized, "Ooh, I got to look into this again." And, and and I started doing it, but I did it responsibly this time, um, and I tiptoed all my my way into uh, theism. So the the big biggest thing there was. Under, understanding the arguments for God, and uh, eventually from theism, I went into Christianity because the argument for the historical resurrection of Jesus just to me is one of the most profound arguments uh, that we have, period, in all Christian uh, traditions. That's one of the arguments that's so difficult to argue against that. Uh, you you can't it's so difficult to argue against it that for me it was impossible to say no to jesus in that sense yet i said to myself well and this is where the intellect shows up i well, i'm not going to be a non-denominational christian again that's not me I, i'm a smart guy and all these things and to be fair a lot of uh a lot of the apologetics that I consumed were Catholic, so that influenced uh, uh, me quite a bit. But I did, I did see John Lennox, uh, William Lane Craig, and many of, of the other uh, uh, Protestants who also uh, were are defending uh, theism. So I get involved again in Catholicism, and but it's very and and to my to my chagrin. It was at the beginning, it wasn't even a, 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 a participation that I would even call faithful. It was an intellectual participation. It was, it, it was more a YouTube, a YouTube communion than an actual church communion. And that eventually started changing. And as I started getting into uh, that, uh, those church practices, um, I still was struggling with things from my previous lifestyle when I decided to abandon all Christianity, particularly um, um, alcoholism. So, and uh, the first time I've ever said this anywhere publicly, and I don't mind saying it uh, uh, because it's the Lord uh, saved me from it. And but I did struggle. I struggled a lot, and um, I, I, I saw an opportunity you know, through the sacraments and, and through spiritual practices to try and rid myself of this uh, unholy addiction. I'm not saying that drinking alcohol is bad or anything like that, but the alcoholism, the drunkenness, most surely is. And um, I, tried, I tried so hard. I tried so hard. And every time I failed and, and got another binge drink, uh, into entered into another binge drink, uh, I, I just, it wrecked me the next day. It wrecked me the next day because I was saying to myself, like, I'm failing you, God. I'm failing you, I'm failing you, I'm failing you, I'm failing you. And throughout all these spiritual practices, I was just saying to myself, I need to do this, I need to do this. 
the spiritual practices became more of a magical way of me trying to cure magically uh, what only one person could do. Like I was trying to do the, the saving, not God. I was not allowing God to work in me. I was I was trying to save myself. You know, some would argue that that I didn't understand these practices. Maybe, but um, I honestly don't think that that's the case, particularly because uh, when you start getting into history, you see uh, Martin Luther, Martin Luther was struggling with this as well. So uh, I'm not alone in this and I'm not trying to equal myself to Martin Luther, but there are so many before me who have dealt with this and uh, found God's grace, God's real grace. And it's only after you start uh, getting into understanding the grace that when you read Romans again, that you things start to change. The things start to change so much. And thankfully now I've been sober for uh, a long time now. And as I've been sober is when I started looking for God's grace. Now, as I was looking for God's grace, one of the, the, the key things in all of this was like, this, something's wrong with Catholicism, something, something's off, something's wrong the, uh, theologically. And I knew it in my, in my mind because I knew, I knew, I knew about uh, the Reformation. I knew about Martin Luther. I knew about Calvin. I knew about all the reformers. I knew that. So in the back of my mind, I'm going like, oh, is it? Can't be. But at the same time, there, there was a legitimate pause in me because there was a, a lot of love, and even now, uh, for liturgy. And uh, the Catholic liturgy is, to me is very beautiful. The Orthodox liturgy as well. The Coptic liturgy is beautiful. Liturgy for me is beautiful, period. And I, uh, throughout my reading, I was starting to read the Reformers again. But at the same time, I also found uh, Dr. Jordan Cooper on YouTube. And I re I, then I found which something that I had missed for forever. And that was liturgical Protestantism, Lutheranism, Anglicanism. And uh, to, uh, my mind was blown. I went like, oh, you can have the best of both worlds, like, like Hannah Montana um, singing to myself here. <laughs> and uh, uh, I started just studying. And, and I didn't want to jump like I had done with Catholicism and just keep going down a path because a lot of people are just wishy-washy and they go where their feelings are. I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to be firm. Uh, it, throughout my my 20s, I, I was just a mess uh, going back and forth uh, on, on ideas and, and I needed to be firm in it. So I agreed with the sacraments. I agreed with the liturgy. So particularly the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist, I agreed mostly uh, with uh, the Catholic understanding of it. And uh, if we can go down, we can talk more about my how my views have changed just slightly on the Eucharist, but not too much. But um, one of the things that, that, that got me into studying uh, magisterial Protestantism was that I realized I can get the liturgy, which to me is how, God, and for my and my belief, it's how God wants us to worship. It, it, it totally is. And at the same time, we remove the historical theological abuses that make no sense. We keep grace. And I said this is beautiful. Now the question was because there 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 are two big traditions that fit these molds. One is Lutheranism, the other one is Anglicanism. So, you know, you can start, I started 
reading through a bunch of the theologians, uh, if I'm being more honest, I'm very honest, I love a lot of Lutheran theologians. I also love a lot of Reformed theologians as well. But there are a couple of things that, that caught my attention is that as I kept reading, I couldn't decide because I'm loving both. And, and one of the realizations is, well, the via media. Anglicanism is the midway. A lot of people think that they're the midway between uh, the Roman Catholic Church and uh, and Protestantism. The reality is they're the, 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 they are, in a sense, an in-between those things, but they are also an in-between Lutheranism and Calvinism. So I realized, oh, it was right there from the beginning. And on top of that, um, just the openness of Anglicanism uh, just caught my attention because I went like, I, I, I love Lutheranism, but the very close rigidity of it sometimes works against it. And I just f fell in love with Anglicanism. It's uh, missionary work. I just... Well, I'm like, okay, this is it. This is it. And um, I got involved in a local Anglican uh, church. Um, and I'm right now active in it, um, participating in it. I communicated with uh, my priest about uh, my desire to discern uh, if I am going to be a minister. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I've also now started uh, volunteering, filled out all the paperwork uh, to teach uh, Spanish speakers English. Because it's not just about uh, finding theologically sound things. It's also about, you know, spreading the word and at the same time taking care of the poor and the downtrodden. It's, it's more than just intellectual rigor. It's much more than that. It's being the light and salt of the world. And Catholicism has a, a lot of that, too. Don't, don't get me wrong, but Anglicanism has it, and a lot of evangelical churches have it, a lot of Protestant churches in general have it, and I, 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 I felt as I was doing these things, okay, I'm home. That's basically my story. So much for sharing that, Eddie. Um Man, it's just, it, it's so great for me uh, to think that even like, it's such a privilege that I get to uh, have this opportunity to hear so many people like you, right? Come on and tell their story. Even like you said, right? Some details that you're like, man, maybe I haven't shared this publicly before and, and here you are. And so it's an honor for me and I, I really appreciate you. World exclusive. I'm, I'm sorry. Sometimes I'm, I'm kind of joking when I get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good. But hey, so I have a couple of questions here uh, uh, to follow up on some of the things that you said. So when it comes to uh, something that I like to do a lot in these interviews is try to figure out, okay, if we go through the story, how you ended up becoming Roman Catholic. And you mentioned a few of these things, right? You said you found uh, in particular three things stood out, right? The liturgy, like you said, really, really alluring from Rome, the philosophical and like logical like acumen that they have, um, and then the global nature of the church. And so why don't you uh, unpack those a little bit more and then maybe... Uh, give me your thoughts as to why you think it is that these things in particular draw not just you, but so many other people to Roman Catholicism. Oh, sure. Um, so when it comes to the liturgy, like the, the liturgy is so powerful that Orthodox liturgy attracts Catholics that are in Novus Ordo and things like that. So, <laughs> so the beauty of the aesthetics of it, it liturgy is, is something that, and you can look at it through the Bible and there's a couple of books that I could recommend. Um, I honestly even would recommend Scott Hahn's book on, on the Lamb's Supper on it, just so you get a feel from the Catholic perspective uh, on how it breaks down biblically. That's the, the, the important thing, because that, that's another thing. That Scott Hahn, that was the one thing that, that really blew his mind when he went to a Catholic Mass as well, because it was how it was so aligned with, with the Bible. But at the same time, if you went to a Lutheran church and you went to an Anglican church, you would also find it. But I didn't go to those things. <laughs> I didn't go to those. <laughs> but but you would find that there as well. And if you go through what what the Lutherans and the Anglicans did, 
was that they stripped it from certain abuses, but the core is there. We have a shared core. Same thing with the Orthodox in many ways. We, we share, a, there's some core in liturgy. Liturgy is one of the things that hasn't changed excessively. It has, but it's, it, there's a lot of things that stay the same, and there's a reason for it. It's very historic, and I think that's one of the reasons why people get attracted to it. The one thing I, I, I would tell people is, you know, Rome is not the only one who has liturgy. There's, there's no, and, and that's a great point. I, I, I find that, again, part of the reason why this is so powerful nowadays is, as much as we all joke around and we make a lot of it and we're like, you know, the the, the skinny jeans and like the rock band that's crowd yeah. surfing on something, right? <laughs> and we blow yeah. it out of proportion. Yeah, well, so, uh, the, 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 the bowling ball, the, the beach yeah, ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and I guess in some instances, unfortunately, that's not a caricature, but a lot of the time it's kind of overblown. But there is an element to which you know, um, at the end of the day, right, and, and, I, and I always say this uh, on the channel for people at home to understand, if all that a church has is literally just a hut, like a mud hut, and we don't even have any instruments, or maybe we have like 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 a rusty old like guitar or something, yes. the Lord will be pleased. Right? We're doing the best that we can do. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and this isn't like the Lord only looks at, at places with gold and, <laughs> and what have you. But there's a difference between... Someone that, or, or, or a church body that has very uh, meager earnings, that has, uh, they don't, you know, they're giving the best that they have to offer, right? They're, they're like the, the widow that only has uh, her one little coin to give, yep. right? And, and they're doing the best that they can, the Lord's please. It's interesting that and having uh, not just the resources, but having the ability to have something more transcendent, to have something that, even if you don't have a bunch of money, right? Even something that's like, hey, let me look at history. And well, what is the way that my forefathers uh, uh, worship the Lord? Because I, I want to kind of stay in step with them. Um, and I think a lot of the time people don't, uh, sometimes in, in, in wanting to be trailblazers uh, uh, in the modern day, a lot of the time people don't slow down enough to say, well, wait a minute, was there a reason why they were doing uh, <laughs> <laughs> the yes. liturgy they were doing yes. it. Yes, you know? it, 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 these are the things that that we started looking at. Uh, there was a reason why it was formulated the way that it was. Uh, you know, it's it's after the the, the Levitical, Levitical practice that, that we see in, in the Pentateuch, um, and the additions and the changes that are made are based off of you know you see in Revelation a couple of uh, of things as well, and the the. the the practice itself doesn't need the extra splendor. Yeah. And, 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 and what, what's interesting is the, splen the splendor is not what got me. The steps are what fascinated me. And maybe that's why it was not so difficult for me to eventually abandon Catholicism altogether because I was not looking at the gold. I was, I was actually looking at the the going back to the bible sola scriptura how this liturgy goes step in step with what i see in my bible <laughs> and, and and the global uh the global nature of, of the church uh you know going into the the other one um that one i think that that's just that's just history in the process, right? It's like, for example, Anglicanism has has that that reach. But if you think about how they got that reach, well, British Empire. How did the Catholic Church get that that reach? Well, the Spanish Empire. So uh, uh, it's it, th there are some ha happenstance. So I wouldn't say that that necessarily is a qualifier for 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 anything. But it, but it, it does help when you're trying to spread the word and, and spread the, the gospel. Uh, but at the same time, you know, th there are churches that have m millions of, uh, of followers and they don't have as many missionaries out there as some smaller uh, evangelical or Baptist uh, churches do. So, well, and, and that's part of, at least what I've seen, uh, even with talking with people, uh, and I mentioned in the past, I have plenty of people uh, with some of the work I do on the uh, striving side by side Discord server, I always shout it out. If, if you're new at home, someone watching, you want to, uh, you're a Protestant, you need, you want help with these issues, link down below. But uh, one of the things I always hear from people, and I've heard this several times, is sometimes the global nature is alluring, but s similarly, it's also simultaneously scary, right? Because sometimes people will get this in their head where it's like, well, I mean, my church isn't this like titan uh, that's worldwide, and that's, and it almost becomes like 
an outlook of it's just little old me and my church <laughs> versus yeah. you know versus this massive Roman Catholic Titan with a pope at the helm of it, and it looks so impressive. And so that that one I find is is a is a it hits on two from two different angles. It's yes. like, hey, isn't it really cool that we have this reach? Do we have this ability? And like you said uh, a little bit earlier, the Roman Catholic Church uh, is like I think like the world's number one. Uh, pretty much when it comes to charity, like number one do-gooder, <laughs> I yeah. guess for lack of a better word, when it comes to charity and these things. And so there's an, an, a point of allure there, but also there's kind of like an isolation uh, fear yeah. that comes upon people, I find. Yeah, and and, and 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 I think that a lot of people don't take into consideration that, yes, it's good to have a, a, a global reach, right? But uh, what are you doing it for, number one? Um, and secondly, it's great they have all of that, but are you teaching the right thing as well? So, it, yeah. so it, it it also you know, yeah. Islam is the one of the fastest growing religion out there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and you and you look back at your history, and for for a little while there, Arianism had quite a bit of reach. At, yes, <laughs> as, as well, you know. Yeah, it's so like it's come on. Bit. So yeah. shout out to my boy Athanasius. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and so and that covers a little bit of the global nature. What about the the philosophical acumen, right? Because I mean, you're about to, uh, Lord willing, uh, get your your philosophy degree as well, or start that off. And you and I had uh, it sounds a, a very similar one for me. It was earlier, right? So I was like about to start high school when I started having the well, is God actually real? Like type of thoughts, and that's where like exactly like you said, John Lennox's stuff, William Lane Craig. I feel horrible that William Lane Craig has the Christological issues that he does, uh, which yeah. scare me yeah. for him. But when it comes to everything else, the Kalam cosmological argument is like one of my favorite, probably my favorite argument for God's existence. I love it. He's done so much great apologetics work. But you dig past just a couple people, and it is really a, it's at Phaser. There's a bunch of other Roman Catholics uh, that are really active in, hey, here are the arguments for God. We're going to stand up uh, and we're going to point you to Aquinas and we're going to do these things. And so maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, what, what was the philosophical acumen so alluring and why do you think it's so alluring to other people? Oh, it's a, a, just off the bat when you, because I took some philosophical courses in, in college. I, I didn't take as many to get a minor in it, but I took enough, uh, um, and uh, you start you start looking. And granted, it was a pontifical Catholic university, but you know Aquinas is Aquinas. Oh yeah, yeah. I say. yeah. <laughs> Aquinas yeah, yeah. is Aquinas. Uh, it's like Anselm of Canterbury is you know Anselm Saint Anselm. Okay, and, and uh, but the thing the thing is that. And of course, Augustine. I haven't mentioned Augustine, but I, there's a reason I don't mention him. Um, uh, <laughs> and so you have this, and then you you look at how everything is systematized. There, 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 yeah. There's dogmas and doctrines, and it, 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 it's a it's a it's a government. It's a constitution. It's a philosophical system. It's a lot of things, but it's, into, it's super alluring because yeah. if it feels like the answer, it feels like the answer because you go like, well, here's the structure, here's the this like global communion, here's the this intellectual, uh, uh, all these great into, uh, intellectual giants who are coming out of this tradition, like that's it. This is it. But the, rea but the reality is, and you come from Latin America, and I do too, we see the reality of it. We see the lay people do it, and that's different. That's how it was interesting that, that, that a lot of people here in the United States, you don't see that much, so it's more normal. But for when, when, they, when my, my tia says, que Dios y la Virgen te cuide, you know, let God and the Virgin take care of you, you know, it, it, you're 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 elevating with, with that small thing. She she doesn't know any better. Well, it, what, I, I, well and, and then it's words and it's worse iterations. I mean, uh, I've mentioned this on the channel, I think, once or twice, which is uh, I've been keeping an eye on the the Hispanic side of uh, Protestant apologetics. And, which is, it's fascinating. So many of the same arguments from the, from Rome are just recycled, but in Spanish. <laughs> 
it's, like, uh, it's really funny. And you can tell, you can tell, uh, like, for example, I know William Albrecht speaks Spanish, so you, sometimes he'll jump over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Cameo on a, on a TV show, you know, you're like, crossover. Oh. <laughs> 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 and, like, they're really, really big in, 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 the, in the Hispanic side of apologetics and for the Protestant side. They're really big on idolatry, like, like dealing with idolatry. Because when you go to South America and our Roman Catholic friends, you know, it sounds very, you know, it sounds very, uh, there's some fancy like footwork that happens with, oh, Dulia, Latria, and Hyper Dulia. And really, we have these neat categories. And putting that debate aside for a split second, what actually happens on the ground in South America? And what happens on the ground is idolatry. Yes. It is people on their way to the, I don't know if it's a cathedral, but this massive church of uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe on their knees on the pavement, scraping their knees, holding life-size statues of the Virgin on their back. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. Like, you can you can find these videos, people wearing mantles with the Virgin on their back, uh, people self-flagellating themselves. Uh, it's it's it, idolatry. And, it, and, and it was funny because I was watching even um, uh, one, of the, one of the Protestant apologists, he's... he's like an evangelical Methodist type, Edgar Pacheco, and he's one of the yeah. biggest ones in the Hispanic scene. And he went to uh, to, to that massive gathering of people or, uh, at, uh, at the Church of, Gu of uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe, and he went around asking people, "Hey, sir, like, do you know what like Dulia and, and Latria? And, no, like people on their knees, right? Like, right? And he's like, okay, well, uh, what do you do with the Virgin? Oh, okay, well, thanks. And then <laughs> you're like, this is true. Yeah. You know, like, and, and, and so uh, I guess you're right. That it's also a double-edged sword. Is yeah, it's global, and, and this is great. And you know, all this philosophical acumen, all, all these people that are so smart. But what happens when you go from like behind the screen and behind reading a book to reality? And what you see, and, and these aren't on the ground, hidden away practices. The priests know about it. They're okay with the festivals. They're okay they with everything. They organize them. They organize them. They organize them. They, in Puerto Rico, it's like. They organize it. it. It is part of their required duties. Uh, uh, they organize all these things because it's. Uh, and I know it's sometimes a a, a, a bad word, but syn it's sometimes syncretistic. It is. It, it, you can't you can't go about it in a different. It is sometimes it it works in the positive, but sometimes you end up with Pachamama. Yeah. Or, or, or sometimes you end up, and again, uh, I, I always do my best to, to to tell people at home. I have not researched this myself, so take what I'm about to say with a big grain of salt. <laughs> but for some of my friends, that uh, I have a friend that's been, uh, he wants to be a historian, and he's been reading about like the spread of Christianity and, and uh, the early spread of Christianity in Asia, and he's been trying to read about uh, also some of like the uh, the, the Jesuits uh, missionary efforts throughout history, and he's mentioned, if I remember correctly, that they have issues, for example, Jesuits in Japan. Where they're you know they're a little bit softer on uh, on ancestor worship. They just try to move it to like well, well, as long as you're venerating your ancestors, I guess it's okay if we're not giving the ancestors latria. And if that's correct, then that, I mean that's so, a problem. So I was seeing uh, uh, I was seeing a, a, a documentary on and not on YouTube, an actual document, legitimate documentary from BBC. So it's legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was about these cultic practices uh, throughout. And then in the Philippines, there was this uh, just fertility festival that if you see the fertility festival, you go like, oh, that, that's this, you know, if you're trying to be as respectful as possible, as we should always do, uh, this is this local groups religious, uh, tribal, polytheistic uh, ritual. Oh, no, it's part of the Catholic uh, 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 celebration. What? Yeah. It, it, it is problematic because at the end of the day, every belief has consequences. People don't understand this. People don't understand that. It, it, it's like when we talk about uh, certain things, not getting into that topic right completely, but like, for example, if you say that if I believe that I'm not who I am and I'm something else, well, that applies to a lot of things, not just uh, gender and things like that. It applies to a lot of other things. You accept that one thing now, along the line, thing, thing that keeps expanding. So the same thing, like, same thing, same thing. Latria, 
uh, hyperdulia, you know, and dulia. Okay. We get it. it. It's not like we don't get it. Like, and I'm not an iconoclast in the sense of, look, if you are, there's a picture of Jesus right there. <laughs> and it's like, but it's not like I think that that picture has power. Uh, but I do think, but I do think that that you know, if it helps us didactically, if it's a teach, if it helps us to teach, if it helps us to ponder and meditate, sure, that that's not a problem. It shouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it it, it it gets into different territories when when you get into some of the councils where you say you can't kiss. Uh, if you don't kiss an icon, you're excommunicated. Ooh. What? <laughs> and, and because again, um, what is fascinating to me is a lot of the time, and, and I, I do my best to be as charitable as I can be, uh, even um, when I'm not behind this camera I'm talking to my friends or my family members about this, and they're like, oh, well, you know, all this stuff we see back home in Venezuela or back home in these countries. And I do my best to say, well, you know, keep in mind, even within evangelicalism or within any tradition, you're going to have, you know, wacky things happening. But a, a fair point when I was talking with my dad about this that my dad made is he said, yeah, but you know what the issue is? You know what the difference is? When this happens, whether it's in a, in a Baptist communion or whether it's in Lutheranism, whether it's in the LCMS, whether it, whatever it may be, what normally happens in a healthy setting is all the surrounding churches will condemn this church for doing something crazy and be like, you're excommunicated until you, you repent and we're putting you out. And they're like, oh, we can't stop them. But you know who has a... Uh, a structure that supposedly should help them stop stuff like yeah. this from happening yeah. Yeah. is Rome, right? Like, they, and, and so it's it's kind of interesting to say we don't approve of this. This is really bad. We we that doesn't that doesn't represent uh, what we believe about La Tridulia. That's all and good. Why isn't your hierarchy stopping it? Why are they entertaining it? Right? And why are they and why are they stopping other things that threaten your authority? But but yeah. not but not unbiblical practices. Now, and th that's just like Pope Francis has ma has made the job easier for all of us when we're trying yeah. to explain these things. Because in in real time and in real life, we've seen the contradictions become so glaring and apparent. Yeah, and and again, and we won't go into this now because yeah. we want to keep going. But but uh, like again, even the things that the Pope says, right? When the other a few weeks ago, I think it was. Well, I guess by the time this video releases, it'll be like a month or whatever. But anyway, <laughs> when the Pope said, and again, he went out of his way to say, by the way, everybody, this is not ex cathedra, which fair enough. On a side note, I find it kind of interesting that he felt the need to say that. So, okay, so should we be taking other statements? Anyway, putting that aside, when he, he said that, like, as, as a matter of private uh, opinion, that he hopes that hell is empty. Mm. And it's like, okay, well... That's like, again, you have that cascade a little bit. So you're saying you hope that your entire merit system and the entirety of like, <laughs> I just Christian yeah, opinion, right. it's a little bit weird, right? Yeah. Um, and so, but anyway, putting that aside, it's just a matter of there's, there's, there's this one bill of goods that you're given. And then the actual thing itself is not what it, what, what was sold. I guess yes. that's kind of the idea. And, and then just think. And then just taking it as an example over here in Protestantism, as simple, and when we use Protestantism, I like using more Reformed in general, yeah. the term, because uh, to me, Protestantism, I, I, use the, I use it like Newman would use it, uh, which a lot of people don't know that Newman would use Protestantism to refer more to the Anabaptist type. Yeah. It makes yeah. more sense when you think about Protestantism is more like the Anabaptist and then reformed is more like the Lutheran or the Calvinist yep. uh, churches. Um, stepping that aside, if somebody does something wrong, as you were saying, it's simply going to the Bible and go, that's not what it says here. That's not what the apostles have taught before. Look at what these church fathers have taught before. This is not solo scriptura, it's sola scriptura. So it's not like, what does it say there? Who interpreted it like them? No, you're wrong. It's done, but it <laughs> yeah. doesn't. But it doesn't. Yes, the bishop did something wrong in an, an, an Anglican bishop did something wrong. A Lutheran uh, pastor did something wrong. The system doesn't break. Yeah, exactly. Because the system's decentralized, right? And, and it's and it's like that on purpose. Um, and so, but 
but moving past that a little bit, so, so those were some of the the things that were um, uh, alluring for you and, and are alluring for a lot of people when it yes. comes to Rome. Yes. Now, I want to then uh, kind of look in the opposite direction. Right? So if you think back to when you first converted to Rome, right, and you mentioned this a little bit, but I think it's worth underscoring again, what were the facets of evangelicalism that you had grown disenchanted with? And then looking back, was there any merit to these feelings or did you find that they're actually off base when you look back? So, uh, respectfully to my evangelical brothers, I don't think I was off base in many of my disenchantments. Uh, uh, we had a lot of solo scriptura, a lot of uh, untrained uh, leadership. We had uh, a lot of dispensationalist theology. Yeah. A lot of dispensationalist theology. Yeah. Way too much dispensationalist theology that it it, it, be, it it became problematic in many times when there would be somebody who would just randomly uh, say that the, that there's a pastor would say, "I saw a vision, and this would happen on this date," and and then it was spread on all the churches. It was an issue. Um, the divorce from history, the low view of the sacraments. The Baptist church that I went to was quarterly, I think. And the non-denominational church that I went to was maybe once a year. And usually around uh, uh, Easter. It's like... <laughs> so, uh, but at the same time, now looking back, there's something about... And, and I wanted to touch on, on that. There's something about evangelicalism in general that we need to rescue. And that is Jesus front and center. And that is Jesus front and center. And that's something that, looking back, I missed when I was a Catholic. Jesus front and center in many ways. Um, and now that I'm an Anglican, was, uh, Jesus is front and center again. But at the same time, with those practices, that's why I'm an Anglican. But Jesus needs to be front and center. Actually, if you look... And uh, I was thinking about about, about uh, this when we decided, we talked and we said that we were going to have the interview and everything. If you look at the big words from the churches, each of them apply and we need to rescue them. Catholic, the universal practice throughout church history, we need to have it. Orthodox the keeping of apostolic teaching, the rule of faith, and safeguard that theology. We need to keep it. Reform, semper reformanda, uh, all, you know, wary of doctrinal accretions and that distance themselves from that, have the humility to reform your theology according to scripture and through the reason and academia and all that stuff. Evangelical, passionate about saving souls, Having Jesus Christ as the center of worship, reflection, and devotion, and Episcopal, having you know the ecclesial body and structure, all these things are necessary. <laughs> and a lot of people don't even think about it, but all these words that are being hijacked by 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 churches, we need them all. We need a Catholic, Orthodox, Reformed, Evangelical, Episcopal church. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Actually, I, wow, I'm really happy you said that. <laughs> that's not. That's that's exactly right. And I think a lot of people can be very. Um, uh, and, and it happens to me. It happens to all of us. Uh, we can be very myopic. Yes. And they can just yeah. be. Well, I really care about this one issue. And uh, I, it, I think, I guess, interestingly enough, even thinking scripturally, right? So many of us can get focused on like. You know, let's say in the body of Christ, like if I'm a hand and it's like, oh, well, the hand, like the job of a hand is really important. Right. And we got to pick up tools and we got to. And sometimes we can get maybe so focused on like, well, I'm a hand and being a hand is important. And you have someone else that's like, well, actually, like I'm a leg and <laughs> being a leg is important. And you need to be able to run and, and, and stand up. And and but sometimes some of us can get so like, you know focused, put our blinders on and just be like, well, no, let's say liturgy is really important. Oh, rightfully so. Well, all I care about is liturgy. And maybe we let other things fall by the wayside. Maybe we don't care about, like you were saying earlier, right? Maybe for some of us, we're missing this element of being deeply involved in the community where people know us for our love for one another and for them. But no, all we care about liturgy. For some other people, maybe the opposite. They're so involved in the community. 
the theologically they're just very shallow. Their liturgy yeah. is is lacking. And and you're right. I think we need to kind of look around and say, okay, what is the best that everyone has to offer? <laughs> and, and scripturally speaking, how can we how can we combine that? Congeal it. Yeah, it's basically because when you look at it, like uh, when when I when I see the, I'm going to use a Protestant and I'm going to use a, a a Catholic. When I see Jordan Cooper, humble, meek in the nice, and I don't mean it in a in a pejorative way. I mean it in a nice way. Um, always with uh, passion for Christ. And look at Scott Hahn, for example, saying that meek. You know, nice. You know, showing love in everything he says. Never irate. None of them are irate when they talk. There's something about it that I can go like I can learn from these two men. I don't agree with everything they would say, but I can learn so much from these men. And we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at these things. So much uh, of uh, of these conversations, especially in the internet, in in, in the age of polemics, not apologetics, uh, in the age of polemics, where we have little tribes that form that make memes at each other, and then and then deconstruct what they're saying to each other. Uh, you, you just, uh, it boggles my mind because I, I, I'm just, it, it, with as I'm looking at these things, I'm going like, why are we being so uncharitable? Why are we being so unloving? Like, yeah. because, because what we're focusing on is, as you said, it, we're focused on the hand, we're focused on the leg, and, and we don't, and we don't realize that not just it's the whole body, it's we're missing the entire picture. We're missing the love thy neighbor. We're even missing love God. We're treating God as a puzzle to solve instead of yeah. treating him as a person you need to know. Yeah. And and and, and you know, and, and people go like, well, that sounds evangelical. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In line of what we said about what everyone has to offer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 absolutely. That, that's something that to me is really interesting, which is, and I find sometimes that, at least from my perspective, and I guess I'm a little bit biased because uh, growing up Baptist and evangelical as well, <laughs> I guess I'm a little bit biased too. Yeah. But I often find that some of the people that seem like the best in, in the space that are always loving, that are always there and really smart, but they, they can, you know, they're not perfect, but they can try to balance things out both on the Roman Catholic side and also on the Protestant side interestingly enough, are people that started out evangelicals, <laughs> right? Because yeah. if there's something that sticks with you about, I need to have a relationship with Christ. I want, I, want, I need to be excited about other people knowing Christ. Um, and so I, I think I'm happy that you mentioned that because that's that's a good way to temper uh, the same way that with Rome, we can say, man, they do have a, a great philosophical acumen. They do have a great liturgy, but then here are the drawbacks. With evangelicalism, you're right. Uh, evangelicalism is uh, an inch deep, but a mile wide. Right. And, and so there's a lot of drawbacks to that. There's not a lot of theological depth in a lot of places. Uh, and that's not the same across the board. But in a lot of places, that's just how it is. There's especially not a lot of historic or liturgical yeah. depth. But then on the flip side of that, there's a passion for Jesus. There's a passion for missions. There's a passion for reaching the lost. And, and that, I think that's something that, you know, we, we need to be able to balance. We need to rescue it 100 percent. And like I said, if if if, you, if we start doing this more and, and because one once we get into into all, all all of these like dividing them like I did the reason why 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 I did that is because I wanted to touch on on everybody I I, I wanted to to show that there there are a lot of things that we need to rescue from from, from, from each other but at the same time we need to have that reformed mindset of look we didn't do right here we need to be humble and recognize no let's let's go back and think about it like for example right now i hold uh, i hold to a more latin way of understanding uh the filioque but if i through the bible reason and scholarship Three of them combined, and you know the patristic voice and all all of it combined. I see that the Eastern way of understanding the filioque is more correct. Hey, I'll reform uh, on that yeah, yeah, totally. and, and and move forward. It's it's oh, I I was wrong. God was always right. I just didn't understand him. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah, 
Yeah, I was wrong, but God was, I, I like that a lot. I was wrong, but God was always right. And, and that really is, funnily enough that you say that, that is at the heart of of the Reformation, right? It says, hey, guys, we've gotten some stuff wrong for a while, but good thing that God was right the entire time. And, yeah. and, and that there's... There is a there there is such a thing as correcting the course of the ship. You know, we don't yep. have to sink the ship. Um, and so let me ask the question. That I'm probably going to go a little bit out of order with some of the other questions sure. I had here. But so we often hear right uh, that infamous line you referenced it earlier by John Henry Newman, and even this line itself is actually misunderstood because to yes. your point, uh, when Henry Newman speaks about Protestants, he's actually really referring to the more Anabaptist types. Uh, like if I remember correctly, like his brother uh, who was uh, was he a Quaker? No, he was a uh, Puritan sort of. Yeah. I don't remember the details. Like, from the office, uh, but yeah. Yeah. like, like with a with a, with an Anabaptist heritage uh, situation. Um, when he refers to Protestants, that's actually what he means by that word. Uh, but again, this gets thrown around online all the time. To be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Yeah. And what I find fascinating is you had the opposite experience, right? And so you mentioned, I mean, being trained as a historian yourself, yeah. uh, becoming steeped in the church fathers and in church history. That actually led you to doubt the legitimacy of Roman Catholic claims. Yeah. And so maybe you want to break down for us, what are some of the historical issues that you found? What are the things that you noticed uh, as cracks in Rome's armor as you began looking at history? So uh, I spent uh, a billion years thinking about how uh, I can best approach, because when I told you that, I'm like, oh, I want to ask you about that. And we're like, okay, so that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's like yeah. that's like 10 years worth of reading summarized into maybe a few sentences, but I'll, I'll try my best. <laughs> um, so I wanted to touch on first, um, I think that it, because it is the one thing that it, it's always mentioned, the papacy. Let's start with the papacy. Mm -hmm. um, because, and I'm going to mention some other things, but I'm just going to, you know what? Let me do this. For Marian dogmas, and how they're not biblical, just watch Gavin Ortland's uh, 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 videos on them. And for Sola Scriptura, Sean Luke's uh, work on, uh, on Sola Scriptura and understanding how it actually works, uh, because I just don't have time to cover all of this. It's just like, it would be like a 20-hour uh, thing. So <laughs> I want to focus on the papacy because the papacy is the one that has to do with the most historically, at least from, from my side. It's the one that um, you can definitely get get a feel for. And I want to focus, trying to keep into in the Protestant vein of things. Let's do first uh, Bible. Let's go to let's go to the Bible and so you know Matthew sixteen thirteen to twenty when you you know uh, when you get that that line you know uh, you know blessed you are Simon Bar Jonah uh, for no flesh has revealed this to you all that is phenomenal right and and, I, and we'll I'm gonna unpack that uh, in a moment but I I really wanted to focus on a couple of things there's first the blessing right. Uh, then uh, because of how this was revealed, okay? So we know this is a blessing, period. Um, and then Peter is called the rock, and upon this rock, uh, uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail. That's claim, that's, that's, that's two claims, right? Peter's the rock, and upon this rock, you know, gates of hell will not prevail. I want to talk about that in a moment. The other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, whatever you bind on earth uh, shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosened in heaven. So I want to talk about that in detail because uh, a lot of people take this just by itself. And that's poor biblical exegesis in general. When I did, when I was at Liberty, yes, I focused a lot on church history because it was my biggest interest. So one of the things we had to do was take some biblical classes, uh, so on um, Bible interpretation. Now, I didn't take a lot to consider myself a theologian. I'm not a theologian. I'm not trained in, in, in Greek, so I couldn't get into that. So I'm just using the ESV translation of it just for the people at home who are wondering. Um, so the first thing that I want to focus on, uh, simple things that, that people uh, know, is that, you know, Peter's not the only one who, who gets the keys. Um, uh, 
in the Fourth Lateran Council, they say that the apostles get the key. Now, what is interesting about it is that it's actually prophetic, because what what Peter does in 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 this uh, eventually is that in Acts two, uh, what does he do? He preaches to the Jews. Uh, in Acts uh, eight, to the Samaritans, the Northern Kingdom. In Acts 10, he's the first to preach the Gentiles. So he does open the kingdom in that sense for all of them. And you go like, okay, so but so but he has the keys. And I'm going like, well, hold on. Because that part about uh, binding and loosing and, and everything, let's I want if you go to uh, in 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 the in that same book in Matthew, something I, I've always found really interesting that people don't mention a lot, and I don't know why they don't, because it's it's there when in Matthew twenty three, when he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he says that you have shut the kingdom. So it's it's in the same book. We're using the same analogy, right? So. So when we talk about shutting and everything with the kingdom, what we're referring there is is more along the lines of pastoral in nature than anything else. And 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 just so so a lot of people are Catholic listeners and everything don't get, I do hold that Peter did have a primacy, and there's a reason why he got them first. Like look at the prophecy, look at how. He's the one who opens them up, and if and then we're going to see the historical patristic voice in a moment. But it, 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 the keys are not what we would say uh, as a sign of infallibility, because that the the gates uh, of hell will not prevail uh, against him and, and, and things like that. It's not him; it's the church. But at the same time, that's a callback to what the promise of Abraham. <laughs> that you will conquer the gates of your enemy. And um, I don't have time to unpack all the gate allusions in the Bible, but the gates are important because they are associated with judges and elders. So again, this is pastoral. This is a pastoral uh, in nature. Um, moving that aside, uh, the binding and loosing and everything. So we see that even though he has a, a certain primacy, uh, over the, the, the other apostles, um, what you end up seeing is that for him, the most important, uh, how can I best phrase this? He is the pastor of the pastors in a way. He's the care of, of their carers in a way. So he has a special role. Yes, he does. It's, it's there. It's there. He is caring for them. He he has been given this role by Jesus. That doesn't mean it's it, it, it's inherited. <laughs> yeah, and that that's a very important thing because when we look at at, at the historical record, um, you look at at why do the bishops of Rome, at least for example, Clement, um, address at the Church of Corinth. I wouldn't argue that's because of, um, and if you just look at how they the the, the churches operated back in the day, they, he wasn't using it under, under the authority of Peter. I think he was using it under the authority of Paul. What I, what I, what what you do see in, in the early church is that whoever whatever apostle founded a church, like those apostles would. The, the successors of those apostles, the bishops of the, that would succeed those apostles, would kind of be in charge or continue pastoring those churches that they founded. So there, now obviously this is not the book that I'm writing uh, on anything. So, but it's just basically so you get an idea of where I'm getting at. And uh, regarding uh, that, you, you see with Clement, yes, he's talking to Corinth, but. Paul was the one who established Corinth. That's why. That's why he's writing to them. Okay, so um, and you can keep seeing this th throughout. Because, for example, Saint Ignatius, even though Saint Ignatius is a very, I would say, one of the best early voices that could argue in favor of the papacy. Because again, we're trying to be charitable. We're trying to be. Uh, 
as honest as possible. Let the truth, semper reformanda, right? Like, let the truth guide us. Um, Ignatius is the patriarch of Antioch, and he's writing to other churches. So, the, Rome doesn't have an exclusive authority, is, is what I'm trying to get to. So, uh, aside from that, then you get into the whole uh, the uh, Cyprian and Pope Stephen uh, 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 debate, and to me, that that is a an episode that reveals a lot, because when Pope Stephen is claiming a special authority, Cyprian goes like, "Where did that come from? No, <laughs> no, no." So it's not like it was known. Uh, some people would say, well, Cyprian held uh, to weird views. Had views that we no, nobody agrees with 100%. Um, then you have um, uh, just, uh, then you have, um, what's it called? The going a little bit further down history, uh, the, the Avignon Papacy. The Avignon Papacy is <laughs> the Avignon papacy the reason why i like doing a little bit of, of everything is because i'm just letting people know a little bit about all the, the 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 episodes so you can just search it for yourself right uh because i i'm not this is i'm not an apologist i'm not somebody who i'm not somebody who rehearses uh all this for for a week and then goes in and says like here's my powerpoint slide about xyz with the quotes and everything like that i, I did write some a little bit here so to help me guide my thought process but you know the avignon papacy you know i don't this is the important thing about history right uh, when we do history, we can't look at history ex post facto. Like, look at history as if you were there. For a moment, when there are three popes all running around, who's the pope? And if you, if you accidentally showed allegiance to the wrong pope, that's it. And if 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 salvation depends uh, based on you know if you would we would use unum sanctum the the document that says you know outside of the church there is no uh, salvation if you would use that argument yikes it, it, it's it, it again Jesus is no longer the protagonist the Pope is and this just reminds me of something that uh, Scott Hahn said off the cuff one time. Uh, that he said, you know, the Pope isn't the head of the church, Christ is the head of the church. And there were a couple of uh, people who are more into the defending the Pope more, I'm not going to name names, but so now, how dare you say that? <laughs> Saying that Christ is the head of the church is a problem? <laughs> These these are the the, the things that, that 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 we see, and of course we can go in history and see a Pope Francis, right? Um, so just uh, just so everybody can at least start looking at, at at it, right? The the main claim is, you know, even though Peter had a special, uh, at least my claim, I'm not trying to make it uh, any more than that. Um, Peter did have a special role with the apostles, just like Abraham did, just like Mary did, but it's not inherited, right? Abraham can be considered the father of us by faith, but nobody inherited the, the father of faith title. And he had a special blessing, but nobody inherited it. No. Uh, Paul had a special teaching uh, 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 authority, but nobody inherited that special teaching authority like Paul. Yes, they did preserve that uh, apostolic teaching and to, to teach, and yet, but not like Paul. It was the same thing. Peter did have a special role to play. And if you look at Matthew, Matthew is presenting uh, Jesus as the new Moses, right? So in a way, and I'm not saying because I've never seen anybody argue like this, if Jesus is the new Moses, then it, even though Jesus is also a type for, for uh, uh, sorry, 
for Joshua. Um, you could make an argument that if Jesus is the new Moses and you continue that typology, as he is delivering the people and saving them from the promise and taking them to the promised land, then he sets Peter like a Joshua to, to conquer, right? Um, but it's a special thing that nobody inherits the, the throne of Joshua. It's the, it's the seed of, of Moses. Um, and they go, like, no, but the judges, and we could, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that's a great point because one of the things that I run into, and and again, you know, with a lot of love for uh, uh, the the apologist on the other side, that even when I was like on the verge of like, is Rome right? What is going on? A couple of years ago, not and again, maybe I misunderstood it, but from my understanding, one argument that I never in a million years found convincing. Uh, was the Eliakim typological argument. And, and that's no. One, and that's, oh, my and, God, and that's yes. One, yeah. And, and that's one that, man, it was getting fraction. It was getting, not so much anymore, but it, it was getting a lot of people. And, and again, with a lot of love for, for its main proponent, so Ansana, I think he seems like a super nice guy. He seems like a great guy. He's incredibly smart. Like, he's in Harvard, for, for goodness yes. sake. So definitely, definitely way smarter than me. But <laughs> putting that aside, um, the argument itself, it, it, it's, to me, it, it seemed, it, 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 almost everything seemed ad hoc. It's like, it's like well, we have certain things that we are, are uh, that are passing over from the type to the anti-type, uh, and we have things that are convenient. Pretty, uh, it's not how they would say it, but that's honestly the way that I, I viewed it was whatever was convenient was passing, and whatever yeah. was inconvenient for the thesis, oh well, that doesn't really pass on. From, no, <laughs> like, the anti -type. Yeah, so you have to be honest. Like for example, I acknowledge that Ignatius makes a very potent claim for the primacy uh, uh, of the papacy because. It doesn't bother me because it's not in the Bible, but he is a church. He is a church father that does argue like that, and you have to take that into consideration when you're looking at these things. But at the same time, he is also the bishop of Antioch, patriarch of Antioch, Antioch who's uh, you know writing to other people with uh, some level of authority. That you go like, well, okay, so it's not that clear cut either. Dynamic, yeah. And going to the Eliakim argument because, like. Jesus, that's why I mentioned the kingdom bit, because in Matthew, the kingdom is referenced like that. You know, the, 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 the Sadducees and the Pharisees are shutting the kingdom, and, you know, the apostles are going to open the kingdom. But then when we look at the Eliakim argument, the Eliakim argument says the, house, the key of the house of David. Where does the key of the house of David appear? In Revelation. And who has the key? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, obviously, the, 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 he has <laughs> hours and hours, and, and yes, and of my rent. So it, it goes beyond that, right? We're not no, trying to do that. Uh, yes. uh, I, I don't want to debunk it like that because it wouldn't be. But it's it it it, it falls into, and, and this is the other argument that I would say that it falls under the view. The I would call it. And this is my own phrase for it. I would call it the federal view of the episcopacy. Hmm. So it's basically the, every bishop is their is is their own jurisdiction, but there is one elected who supervises everybody. So kind of like a federal system in politics, right? Hmm. Where you know we have like here in the United States, we have fifty states, but we elect a president and the Congress, and and uh, there is a polity. There is a government that governs the other governments, basically. Um, so that view of a federal episcopacy is not present in the early church fathers. And, and that's the best way I can put it. Yeah. It's more along the lines of a confederal uh, system of the uh, episcopacy, which basically is like the confederal system that we had here in the United States, where all the states basically did whatever they wanted. Yes, they did meet once in a while. They might have, in here in the United States, it didn't work too much, but uh, the Articles of Confederation didn't work here. But, but that's beside the point. <laughs> U.S. history, not church history. <laughs> but uh, but the point is, like, it's more of a confederal vision where they get together, decide a couple of things, take that decision, spread it to 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 the other uh, uh, churches, and, and, move, and move on. It's kind of like the view that that is present. There's more of a confederal system. That view, that 
government style that you see there is more akin to what you see in judges in general. Uh, not, and I'm not saying this is 100% because, like I said, I'm, um, I'm not making an argument that it's exact. I'm not going into the yeah. academic details of it, but I'm saying it's more akin to, uh, and, and um, because when uh, God gives in Deuteronomy uh, to the people of Israel, He calls them a kingdom of priests before they've elected a king. So, uh, so when Jesus is putting himself as king, there is sort of that level of, of dialogue there, that wording there. Again, not saying it, 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 it's well thought out, but it's, it's something that, that needs to be considered when people are, are arguing these things. Because just because we assume it's kingdom, and yes, he is the son of David, doesn't mean that the organization is going to be like a kingdom. Actually, yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, yeah, no, absolutely. And the thing with, with typological arguments for me, including the one for the papacy, including other things, and again, uh, everyone at home, please take this with a grain of salt. Yes. <laughs> I, I, yeah, please. But personal understanding, as of right now, and this is a subject to change, is I think of typology a little bit similar to so, when the apostles are doing typology, because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, this is like, I'm sure all of us had this, you know, we all make memes about this, so we see them on Instagram and other places. We all had in like English class growing up, where the teacher's like, and why do you think that the walls on the room in the story are yellow? Like, what does that mean? And we're all like, what? I don't know, maybe the author just liked the color yellow? Why are we, why are we sitting around asking this? But when the apostles do typology, that is, because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, that is the author of the story coming in and saying, hey, the reason the walls were yellow is actually because X, Y, or Z. Or in this case, right, actually, when you look back at all these things, these are all foreshadowing Christ. Actually, when you look back at these things, this is foreshadowing baptism. Actually, when you look, that is the author of the story coming in and verbalizing for us, or I guess uh, putting it round, I'm not verbalizing, uh, but anyway, putting oh, it right. down, writing, it for us, <laughs> <laughs> writing it down for us. That we say, well, I'm going to do my own typology. Here's what I think the author meant by this. The issue we run into is we could be right, or we could be like our third grade English teacher that is like, oh, I know exactly why the walls were yellow because, and they're just making it up. When if you just ask the author, oh, I just like the color yellow. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and, and oh, no, I agree 100. percent That's that's a great analogy. Honestly, that's a great typology. Uh, <laughs> but but in all seriousness, like when I say that, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm I'm very specific about. I'm not making a theological claim. I'm I'm just historically analyzing that what you see is more akin to what you see in judges in terms of tribal leaders. A tribal confederate. Uh, uh, there's tribes, and then the king is God. Basically, it, it, it is what you see more. You don't see you don't see Rome taking uh, the presidents of uh, the presidency or the or any of that. It's just not there. And they go, oh, well, doctrinal development. Okay, but. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we have to be careful with doctrinal development because um, there's a difference between when you say, um, and go bless the people in the name of, in singular, of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What does that mean? How can one be three? How does that work? And getting clarification through linguistic, linguistic clarification, which includes uh, philosophy and other things, linguistic clarification of what three and one mean, uh, that Jesus is man and God. What does that mean? Like getting, getting clarification. Sure. Doctrine develops, but adding to it, like, like I said, it's, it's, why is it a, a uniquely, uh, uh, <laughs> a Roman thing uh, when, when we have other people who share the Orthodox have, have a more confederal uh, way of the Episcopacy. So does Anglicanism. So does almost everybody else. Why? Because that's what was originally there. And that's and that's a great point with doctrinal development. Because again, uh, we all would have been, well, 
the Eastern Orthodox, I'm sure they would admit to something real, though. They're, they, they would probably be the ones likely to say, no, we've never changed. But <laughs> everyone, everyone agrees that you have doctrinal development in exactly the way you're describing, which is we sharpen and sharpen or sharpen our understanding of the Trinity. We sharpen and sharpen our understanding of justification. We sharpen, you know, what we mean when we say that uh, Christ has two natures, right? Like, we sharpen these things over time. And that's why yeah. you see, for example, with even great church fathers like Justin Martyr, you know, his last name wasn't Martyr. He was martyred <laughs> for the faith. And here we have this great martyr. But the, he seems a little bit confused about the Trinity, right? Like, like, like he's... He's got the, I guess, no, no pun intended. He's got the spirit, right? Like he's got the right spirit, <laughs> but, but he, some of the language that he uses isn't that clear, and he seems yes. a little bit confused. And, right? and, and, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. I'll let you continue your point, but it's like if you read him, you go like, it sounds a little bit heretical here in a couple of places. Not a lot, but a little bit. Sometimes you go, like, so keep going. My bad. But you're like, well. We're gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. I think he's just a little bit confused, yes. and 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 that's okay, right? We're 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 fully figuring, we're starting to figure things out. The more and more people have conversations, the more that uh, the pastors of God's church, the theologians, that everyone gets together and speaks, the more clarity we have on these issues. Uh, but there's a difference between that and the trial development being used to develop things out of thin air. Or to or to have uh, theological U turns. I, I remember. I think it was. It may have been one of a. Uh, it may have been Jimmy Akin and Trent Horn's response to Gavin Orland. Although I'm not exactly sure. But if I remember correctly, they even talk about like uh, when they're they're trying to defend icons and they take the route that it's a doctrinal development and it's valid. And if I remember correctly, I think Jimmy says that it's okay sometimes doctrinal developments include U turns. And it's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> that's not. That doesn't sound like a development. That, that's, 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 that's like, like <laughs> Yeah, that's like a contradiction. <laughs> and so. We need to be careful with that, um, and, and it's, yeah, it, it's just, I, I find that a lot of the time, and I want to ask you this, and then I'll move on to some other uh, uh, questions here. Uh, for you as a historian, and I wanted to ask you this, because it's something that, that I've been trying to think of myself as I'm starting to read the Fathers, as I'm starting to, uh, Lord willing, and uh, in, in the near future, maybe starting uh, some historical theology education, further education. Um, one of the things that I find mm, very troublesome, even from my from my layperson perspective when it comes to history, is a lot of the time, whether we're talking about uh, the canon, whether we're talking about just the church fathers in general, actually, I'll go with that, just the church fathers in general. I find, and I'm happy that you said something to this effect earlier, people a lot of the time just assume, oh, the father said X, Y, Z, and that's enough. That's enough for them. Like they, they, It's like they don't even explain, they don't understand why the father said that. They don't know how to contextualize, or well, the fathers actually decided this, decided this canon at this time. You're like, okay, do you understand that a light didn't shine from the heavens and like into their brain and reveal to them the canon? Like they, they had arguments, they had things they were saying. One of my worries, and I want to get at your opinion on this, is a lot of the time I find that people are looking back and, you know, we're no longer spurning history like a lot of uh, modern people do. We're like, oh, those guys were all dummies, right? Like we're not, we're not, we're not falling into that pitfall, thank God. But I almost feel like we fall into a different pitfall where we're kind of deifying these guys or we're like the reasoning doesn't matter. It just yes. matters that they said X, Y, or Z. Um, how do you, how do you, uh, what, what do you, what do you have to say on that? And is, is that something that you think it, we should uh, uh, be a little bit uh, wary of when we're engaging yeah. with history? Oh, a hundred percent. I call it uh, Nisi Fontes, just the sources. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> just the sources. Just the sources. It, it, it's kind of like a solo scriptura sort of scenario, but just with sources, right? So it's not mentioning names, but think about the one hour, two hour, three hour streams of some YouTubers that love uh, theology. Uh, some I do believe love God, some I, I question legitimately but i don't know their hearts so um but it's how they talk that i makes yeah. me question things uh, um but there's going and pouring over so many documents and don't get me wrong they're very interesting but in order to be saved you need to know church history philosophy linguistics you know, it, it, it becomes a problem. Uh, it, I think, what, who was it? Eric uh, Ibarra said, uh, you know, if I miss that one document, uh, 
and he's right. Like, like this is this this is the path. This is the road that leads to the anxiety. Am I right? Well, let me take you to the Reformation then. <laughs> um, let me take you to the Reformation. Sola fide, sola gratia. You know, you know, understanding that. Oh, am I safe? Well, you're baptized. That's good. That's it. That's all you need. Oh, how, how do I know that that my baptism is effective? Well, you're taking the Eucharist. You're good. <laughs> That's it. You're, yeah. you're you're communing. Look at how simple it is. Like. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to make some mistakes along the way or anything, yeah. and understand things, and we should study scripture. We should study scripture, but and we should study church history and we should study the linguistics. Why? Because it is, it is the the truth is obviously godly, so it is the it's important to get as close to the truth as possible in our flawed understanding of it. But be careful with Nisi Fontas. It's like the best way that I can describe it because quote mining, uh, which happens a lot, uh, going over a document, and then I'm I'm looking at countless YouTube channels, right? And they so the the, the he, here's here's the taking a little dick because we're uh, on the evangelical side it's like look at how you know look it's just like this superficial hallmark thing where you're going like what and then here you have the the dark edgy sister of it of that side which is like people smoking cigars and and, and pouring over five-hour videos uh, uh, on just one document and what it means and the history of it and everything like that. And I see these both sides and I'm going like, we need death. Yep. <laughs> but we also need charity, love, and we need a bunch of more things at the same time. Nisi Fontes is not going to get you that. Same thing as Solo Scriptura because Solo Scriptura, you're not interpreting throughout history. You're not interpreting... Uh, uh, you know, with academia behind it, because academia is important. You know, having having this having the sources to analyze it. Oh, but I don't want to be an academic. Great, buy a Bible that has a commentary on it. Buy two or three of them. Yeah. It, it's it's you don't have to be an expert at it. Just get a couple of them, and as you read, the, every time you read, because you should be reading your Bible. That's one thing you should be doing. You shouldn't be checking all those sources out. You should be checking out your con church's confessional standards, your Bible, as obviously as the highest standard, the church confessional standards, and whatever book you want to read. Like, and that's yeah. one of the things that, that I find interesting is sometimes, yeah, especially a lot in our circles, for one reason or another, um, and, and there are valid concerns on both sides, right? There are people yeah. that at live and die by this scholar said this at the end. It's like, okay, well, we can't do that. <laughs> but then you have the other side that is like, it's almost like they hate scholarship. And that's very, I think that's very silly yes. as well. But something that I find fascinating is, and both sides will do this, it's, you have one side that'll be like, oh, the scholars, the scholars. And you point at the church fathers, and suddenly they don't care what they have to say. And that's bad. But then fascinatingly enough, you have the same people that are like, well, the scholars, the scholars, those that's silly. Who needs scholars? But all I need for my opinion is that ex church father said so. And you're like, oh, hold on a minute. Like, <laughs> this is, yeah. you're saying the same thing. You just have a different subject for <laughs> It's the exact same reasoning. It's just a, a different person that you're, that you're quoting, right? And yes. they're just separated by a couple hundred years. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I wanted to get a little bit of your opinion on that because that, that's something that I've noticed as well is like, man, how often are we, because here's the thing, right? And we're not the only ones that do this. Like Rome does this. Yes. Rome will say, hey, you guys are rugged individualists. You'll take some fathers, not others. Watch what happens when you find the church father that agrees with uh, your Protestant tradition over Rome. And suddenly it's, well, but what this father said on this issue is not representative of the capital T tradition. It's the same game. It's everyone is looking back and saying, okay, uh, what are the fathers saying? Uh, how can we interpret this with the history of the church and with all the, the our forerunners that came before us that are handing us this this uh, a bloodstained baton of Christianity, right, going down the ages? But then we got to go back to scripture. And when we... 
I guess my, my, my point here is, and then we can move on to, to some other uh, stuff here is what I've found myself, even just starting to get into some of these sources myself is there's almost a power to like, when you start getting into the sources and when you hear their arguments, because you can kind of go like, okay, <laughs> father said this. Okay. And, and I, I think that's a bad argument. <laughs> and, then, and then what are they going to do? If, if, if all they have is no, no, but he said it, but that father said it. It's like, that's it. That's no different from, oh, well, X scholar said this. If you yes. don't know why they said it, if you don't know, you can't, if you're not in, if you're in no position to evaluate why it is that they, the merit of their claim, the fact that somebody said something is kind of useless yes. unless you understand why they said it. No, right? I a hundred percent agree. It's like, if he, here's the best way to, uh, to, to take it. It, as a historian, right? It's like the church fathers are the Federalist Papers, right? That's the they. Uh, if you don't know what the Federalist Paper are, it's eighty-five essays that were created. It shows you what, what what I teach usually every day. So because what I use is my analogies, right? <laughs> um, uh, the church fathers. I kind of like the Federalist Papers. Okay. Um, that help us understand better what was written in the Constitution, right? And at the end of the day, the Constitution is still a Constitution, and you have to follow the Constitution. So the Federalist Papers do help us understand uh, uh, these things, but just because the Federalist Paper said something does not mean that that's what's there in the Constitution. Um, same thing with if you see the, the private letters of Thomas Jefferson, the private letters of John Adams, um, just because John, Ad sorry, just because uh, Thomas Jefferson was a deist does not mean that the United States is a deist state or, or yeah. the intention yeah. of separation of church and state. It, it gets into a different argument and we can use, just so people understand, because sometimes we're so narrow in it, we don't pull aside and realize this happens everywhere. This is this is what we call dialectics, right? This is just like powerful arguments on anything, um, using a non-political, non-religious example. Dieting. You can make a proper argument for a carnivorous diet, for a paleo diet, for a keto diet, for a vegan diet, for a Mediterranean diet. There's a bunch of scholarship that's going to back up all of them. There's a bunch of them that are going to help you out. They're going to you feel healthy. There are going to be a bunch of people who are going to feel healthy. And I tell you, these, this is amazing. There's going to be a bunch of detractors that are going to say, uh, well, you should be picking uh, this. Be, look, this, these are the side effects of the paleo diet. These are the side effects of the vegan diet. And you said to yourself, what am I going to do? What am I going to eat? I'm going to drink water. That's what I'm going to do. You can't drink <laughs> yeah. water. You need to eat. But yeah. Yeah. here's what you do. You sit down, you you pick something, and you live it. And you live it the best way you can. If it backfires, like, for example, I lived Roman Catholicism. It backfired on me. Uh, this, it's, it's synergistic claims backfired on me. Uh, um, and uh, the monergistic claims of, of the Lutheran, uh, of the Reformed uh, tradition, right, They'll say Lutheran Anglican, but Calvinists uh, are Lutherans and it, all of it. Help me find God again in the, in the way that I, that's in the Bible. Through historically too, rooted, rooted, rootedness is important. But at the same time, and this is going to uh, the, the diet analogy again, like you need to live it. Like, what are you doing consuming so much YouTube uh, videos? What are you doing? Are you not reading your Bible? Are you not helping your neighbor? Help your neighbor. Be the light of the world. Are you making memes uh, on somebody? Are you post? Are you posting uh, um, uh, memes uh, against uh, any ex YouTuber? Name the YouTuber, and you're making memes on him making just horrible, degrading memes on them? What are you doing? I don't know it sounds like a rebuke and kind of is, but it, it, the reality is you are not being, you're, if you are doing this, you're not a Christian. You're, or, or, or you're not acting Christianly. 
because the reality is we should be acting in love and charity and understanding. Somebody gets something wrong. Hey, guess what? That's, I don't agree with that. Why? Well, here's the biblical evidence that, that I found. Here's the academic evidence and everything like that. Let's hash it out. Just like, for example, um, usually, most of the time, I, when I've seen uh, Gavin Ortland interact with uh, Joe Heschmeyer oh, until recently, but but usually when they're in those debates, you know how nice that. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I stepped over my time. Oh, don't worry, it's okay. That's okay. loving Christ, man. And those are Catholics and Protestants, and and you see it on both, and not just one or the other. You see both acting that way. That's what needs to happen, because then if not, you're going to end up. Um, and I've seen atheists, Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants in that camp. I'm not going to, and I, again, not mentioning names, but I'm going to describe the action of yelling, belittling, uh, just like ad, ad hoc, uh, you know, ad baculum, uh, just all the nastiest sort of interactions that you see on YouTube. And you, and you go like, and you dare say you're for christ yeah it, it's like you know, <laughs> scriptures say they'll know us for a love for one another <laughs> you know and and so if, if i can summarize a few things that you've said here because I, I do agree um so for people at home right so what we're not saying is oh it's it's subjective and just you know do, do what works best for you but what we are saying is this is a uh this search for the truth especially when we're talking about which uh, tradition we believe to be most representative of scripture and most uh well in accordance with the truth is a multifaceted search. And if we think that we're just going to be, you know, uh, I can sit behind my, my screen and not go to church and not read my Bible. And I'm going to like mega mind this out and just like watch enough uh, YouTube apologetics that I'll piece it together. That's not going to happen right? for the same reason that, oh, I'm, I'm only going to focus on on uh, going out and doing acts of kindness and charity. That's great. But if you only focus on that, you might find out that you don't have deep roots theologically, and you can be tossed to and fro by every wave and wind of doctrine. And so this is a multifaceted thing, if I if, if I understood you correctly, right, that we need to engage on a practical, we need to be plugged into our local church, we need to be reading the scriptures, we need to be praying, we need to be fasting, especially if it's something that weighs heavy on our heart. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to pray and fast, and we need to do research, but all of these different things need to work together. It can't just be like an isolation Otherwise, that's how we end up hateful. That's how we end up. And again, people at home, right? If you're, you're making memes and good fun. Like, I make memes. That's fine. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I make memes too. Heart, but... yeah. yeah, it's just what is the heart behind it, right? It's, it's Are we actually seeking for the truth? Are we trying to be loving to people? Are we Are we trying are to educate? Because they're, they're like, educate. They're, they're like Redeem Sumer's memes and John Anglican. Yes, they're a little bit spicy sometimes and everything, but they are educating. They're, they're also not supremely uncharitable and mean. They're not mean. Usually, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 and so it's about being balanced. And so, with that, right, I actually I want to go down down that, that line of thought. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the papacy and some of your historical concerns, and, and you, you mentioned they had in passing. This isn't meant to be a, a papacy debunked sort of video, right? Where <laughs> we're going through some of your reasonings. And as I always say for everybody, after we're done recording, uh, if any of you can send me a list of recommended reading on various yeah. issues, and I'll make sure to link that underneath for free on my locals for people. And so if you're like, well, wow, he named out like a couple of things. I would like to research that further. I'm sure Eddie can recommend some good books sure. for everyone at home sure. uh, on the papacy and these issues. But speaking of that, right, so we have here some of the more intellectual side and looking at history and trying to weigh out how do we weigh out these church fathers? How do we weigh out uh, what, what seems to be like the working church polity of the early church? But now I kind of want to go from that extreme, speaking about being multifaceted, to the the day by day experience, right? Because for a lot of people, especially those of us that have struggled heavily with ecclesial anxiety, maybe still do, um, Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy, either one, can seem like really, especially when we're just behind the screen all the time, it can seem like this set of propositions almost, right? Where it's like, oh, if I can just, if I'm okay with venerating images, if I'm okay with the larger dual distinction, if I'm okay with the papacy, if I'm okay with, we almost see it as like this this bullet point list. If I can just check off all of these things. But you weren't just at home doing that, right? You actually lived what it was like to be a Roman Catholic. Uh, you actually took the past from your own personal life, what it was like, like you said, uh, uh, struggling uh, with sin and, and, and struggling going back and forth with drunkenness, right? With, with these issues that you had as, as you developed in your hedonistic lifestyle. Um, and Rome, 
right? Supposedly, or not supposedly, but it offers this myriad of spiritual exercises. And, and again, it's one of these things that in the abstract, it's like, whoa, there's all these spiritual exercises. There is my priest. There is uh, all these saint stories. And there's these different things. But yet that didn't help you, right? It proved futile. And so why do you think uh, those things didn't help you at the time? Uh, and uh, on this, uh, I'll be brief. And not because, because I think it's just a it's just a simple answer, really. I was trying to do the the changes, right? And don't get me wrong, as you just quote John Owen, right? You know, there is a there is a participation in your uh, mortification of sin, but the reality is, I was trying to do uh, uproot all of it. Uh, even even now, in all my weakness, I still have weaknesses. We all do. Um, but I can't. I can't start by saying I am going to do this. I need to, you know, in faith present it to God and go like, "Hey, I, I need your help on this, man. <laughs> I can't do this alone, man." And uh, uh, I, I think uh, just taking it uh, on, on on that issue alone of solving it. It's allowing God to do his work. But, but you did certain things. Yes, yes, I did. It's not like uh, it, you all do participate, but at the same time, you recognize the primacy of God in everything, right? And you recognize that if you fail, and that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the key, that's the key difference in Catholicism. That's the key difference. If you fail, somebody's going to pick you up, not point at you. Hmm. God is going to pick you up, and he's going to go, you shouldn't have done that, but hey, let me clean you up. And Versus, and, and you go, Lord, I'm so sorry. It's like, it's okay. It's okay. Um, versus, um, I have now committed a sin. I need to confess. I need to be washed so I can... Uh, continue this process now don't get me wrong uh it's not like uh our catholic uh brethren don't believe in god's love or anything like that like the lord will go when you go to confession the lord will forgive you right but um let me give you an example um i had just gone on a drunken tirade uh, uh, on a night and on the next morning i wanted to confess because i've been like uh, just this is so wrong um, and I wanted to schedule a confession with a priest, and he was not available. The anxiety, the <laughs> and I, you know, it, it, and people go like, "Oh, poor, poor guy didn't understand Catholic theology." Well, maybe, maybe, but but here's the thing: it, it once. If you start understanding, like I was mentioning at the beginning, the consequences of the belief, right? Uh, that's very important. A lot of people just assume like, well, this looks good on paper. Well, have you considered the consequences of it, right? I come up from a profession. There are a bunch of higher ups, academics come up with these brilliant plans to save the education of kids, right? And when they come into the classroom, and I teach um, a lot of kids who are underprivileged, and the, the strategies they come up with don't work. And then you go like, whoa, 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 why didn't it work? Well, because you considered the idea, but you didn't consider the consequence of the idea. Like when you consider, when you, when, when you consider that we have to, like, for example, uh, what, how, how in Clement uh, uh, echoes this like, beautifully, like what Paul says in Romans, right? Uh, Romans 6. Uh, it's just like, you're free. You're free. You, again, I repeat, you are free. And not only are you free, but you're not so subject to sin. And here's the thing, that should free you to fight against it. That's, that, 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 that should free you to fight against it. You're not a slave to it. You, you can fight against it. 
But when you fail, don't worry. The, the spirit is there to lift you up. And, and if I can add something, yeah. that's one of my big things. Uh, one of my, to be honest, pet peeves that I see uh, in, in Roman Catholic apologetics, both at the lay level and also with some of the big name apologists, where there seems to be this disconnect where they're like, well, if your justification is imputed, if, if you don't have an infused righteousness that is inherent to you, the Lord gave it to you, but it's inherent to you now, and which you can amplify or minimize, right, or, or even outright destroy with with mortal sin and why would you do good works what's the point of good works and, and it's there's there's a fundamental disconnect where they didn't read paul <laughs> yeah, they didn't read paul. yeah paul, you know what paul anticipated it now <laughs> well, he did but but our response is like if i've been freed from the power of sin and death how could i not fight against it if i if i've been freed if, if if I know that the Lord Jesus Christ bled and died on that cross for me, and he laid in that grave and he rose for me, how can I who belong to righteousness, who have died to sin, live any longer in it? Yes. Right? Like, like, like it just, it, it's one of those things where there seems to be a disconnect because, and I know they would fight this, obviously, but I, I would contend there's a transactional nature in, in the way that a lot, a lot of Roman Catholics think of justification, where it's like, well, but why would I do good works if I'm not going to receive an increase in justification? It's like, well, this is, we're, we're playing two completely different games, right? We're on two completely different fields, playing different games. Yeah. What we're saying is, because God forgave you, you are now free to go live for him. Because he broke the chains of sin and death, you can go fight again. You can go wage war against sin and death. Yes. Yes. And, and that's something that people don't seem to, to, to there seems to be a fundamental disconnect there. And, and to and be so, fair, yeah. I'm sorry I'm interrupting, and to be fair, you know, just trying to be fair to our, to our, our Catholic brethren, there could be an abuse of that if it's, in, if it's taught improperly, mm -hmm. if it's taught improperly, right? Uh, that's why the sacraments are so, so essential to, to, to line us up uh, in, into understanding that where it all originates, right? And when we read the Bible, you know, we're not saved by good works, but for good works. Oh, that last distinction is important. <laughs> that last distinction is important. Um, and it's funny that the Bible never mentions a lot of the good works that we should be doing. It's on purpose, right? Um, you, well, you know what's the good works that the Bible usually mentions? It's very interesting. It mentions the fruits of the Spirit, right? Then it mentions uh, that we should be what? Reading reading Scripture, worshiping, singing psalms, uh, besides the sacraments, of course, right? Yeah. And, um, reading Scriptures, partic participating in the body, loving God, loving thy neighbor. Yep. And love is one of the fruits of the spirit. Um, so, so it's even imparted in us. We, we we don't do anything now as we go into that journey of love. It's kind of like marriage, if you will. Uh, imagine this is the best way to put it. If and this is the best way I can summarize actual reform teaching, like not. Calvinism, or at least the 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 Swingley Beza version of it, but I'm talking about Reformation, like Luther and and some of the other reformers. The Catholic Church taught you uh, teaches in this way, basically, and, and I'm summarizing. It might be a caricature. I'm sorry if somebody feels it's a caricature. Make sure you love your wife so she doesn't divorce you. Mm versus the reformation that says like uh love your wife love your wife love your wife because because you're gonna experience all these amazing things um now don't get me wrong it, it, if you know divorce if you don't love your wife you're gonna get if you don't love your wife properly you're gonna get divorced right but at the same time, is why are we focusing on divorce? It's it's like, oh, I need to I need to clean the the house so she doesn't divorce me. Oh, I need to cook or or help in the kitchen or help her out here or something or not just wife spouse if you're a female listener right my husband yeah. right uh, I need to make my spouse happy. I need to take him or her out to to uh, 
to, to for a lunch or a dinner i need to surprise her with uh with something because th they'll divorce me they're going to divorce me if i don't do that that's basically what we're talking about it's like yeah, now it's all wrong. now the focus is all wrong now if the focus is oh my god i love you so much i want to do this for you oh my god i love you so much in this case, yeah, we're saying God, but yeah, and the spouse is like, oh, uh, baby, let's say baby. Oh, baby, I love you so much. I want to I wanna uh, clean the house for you. I, I want to take you out to dinner. I want to clean. Same, it's, you're doing the same thing, but your heart's aligned in the right place. And I think, and I think at the end of it, that's the biggest disconnect. Besides... Uh, at the core of it, that's really the big difference between uh, Catholicism and Protestantism, right? Uh, because, like Melanchthon said, if the Pope retracted on that, I, I wouldn't have a problem having a Pope, right? I would have a problem with the infallible uh, teaching part of it and, and, and the magisterium as it's understood and everything like that, because I think it's an addition. And it, and it grew out of necessity, not trying to retread a couple of things. It grew out of necessity, but necessity does not di dictate do dogma. The Bible does. And uh, uh, and yes, there was some necessity for, for a type of, well, especially after the, the Roman emperor fell. Okay, great. We, 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 can, we can understand a couple of the reasons why there was a need for an increase in, in papal authority, politically speaking, uh, because of these things. Okay. But going down to the actual minutia of the most important thing, our salvation, our relationship with God, you just miss the mark by a bit. Some, and what I mean a bit in this case, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that really is ultimately what the Reformation seeks to recover. Now, I'll just say this in passing, because uh, uh, I know by the time I released this, it'll been a month ago, but uh, oh. like Joe Heschmeyer put out a video, oh, where is Sola Fide in the early church? Okay, putting that aside, uh, I think he's wrong, yeah. <laughs> granted. But, um, you know, and we, and we can argue that in a different video. But that being said, that really is what's recovered, right? It's it, and when I say recovered, I don't mean grab out of thin air and right. And we're not saying all oh, the reformers are things are brand new. No, I, I think there was a, a a court of participation that is not cut at the Reformation, even when it comes to justification. There's just a clearing up, right? I guess we're talking about develop actual real development, uh, 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 doctrinal development, where things are being cleared up and we're removing some of the clutter. But it's it takes someone like Martin Luther, not just him, right? Because this isn't just one guy who was having this issue. He was representative of a lot of people, including you, including me, right? Where I love reading Luther I, because it's like Wycliffe, Wycliffe John Hus, just Luther was successful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, exactly. Because so many people were exactly stuck in this system of, I'm just afraid, because again, to this day, Rome doesn't have an infallible list of mortal sins, right? There's there's a big issue with trying to figure out if you did something. Was I really fully consenting to it? Uh, was I was I want to I want to I want to I want to mention mention something. I was watching Eric Ibarra, which I mentioned him twice, and just saying, Eric, I think you're a great guy. Like I, you're one you're one of the, my favorite uh, Catholic online apologists that I actually listen to because I think you're charitable and, and full of love. So. Um, you, he had a discussion with, uh, I think it was Tim Gordon and Classical Theist, and they were having a discussion about uh, this. It, it was a situation, I'm not getting boiled down, the, they spent about an hour and a half talking about somebody in a very particular situation, whether they could uh, take communion or not. An hour and a half talking about the permutations and the... Just say she's forgiven because that's what God said. I'm sorry I interrupted, but it's just that it reminded me of that. And that's because, again, at the gospel, and it's fascinating, right? People say we start looking at the Reformation and we see different issues, especially from an evangelical background, different issues than you think would be involved, right? Or even the way that the Lutherans argue, or the, I was talking to my wife about this earlier today. We were doing a beach baptisms uh, with my church earlier today. Uh, praise the Lord, like 13 people got baptized. It's really, really cool. But, um, like, part of the Lutheran's argument was baptism is a much greater gift and it's a much better deal. Than you're letting on, 
like Rome. <laughs> All right. It's like, like, like the Lutheran argument was like, God is so loving and he's so abundant in his gifts that baptism, not only does baptism save, but baptism saves so much <laughs> that, that you don't need these other planks of salvation of the monastic life and, and of uh, a confession of the priest and penit. It's faith in Christ. Right? I guess it would be more of like a stool where, it's, where like the, the, the base of it is faith in Christ and baptism is the actual uh, stick part of the stool or in the pole yeah. of the stool. <laughs> and, and so it's like, it's like, man, I, and it's funny you mentioned Eric Ibarra because he is actually one of my favorite Roman Catholic apologists as well. Uh, uh, but I remember uh, a video that was actually helpful to me when when uh, uh, that I, I always recommend uh, people this video. Ironically enough, was uh, you mentioned earlier as well his clip on uh, Pints of Aquinas, yeah. where he talks about this and he's like he says that even for himself because he's gone through several denominations. He used to be a Protestant, yeah. and he when he when he he looks back and he's like, man, can you imagine? If it only turned out that if I could read the original German, that Luther would have clicked. Or if it only had turned out that if I knew more Greek, yeah, <laughs> suddenly yeah. I could figure out, oh, and I had read this Greek father, and then, oh man, orthodoxy would have made sense in the original. Or if only I had this one knowledge, and I forget exactly how he says it, but I, I, I really love it, uh, where he was like, man, I have to believe that the Lord Christ, he didn't just hang on that tree or hang on that cross and bleed and die for me, naked and destitute and with people, like the God of the universe dying for me, just for, oh, that's it. I, I should have read one more document. It was, it was stowed in the back of the library. And if I had if, if I had only read that as a father, I, I would have cracked. And, 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 and it, yeah. you know. I agree 100%. Because here's the thing. Like, wh when we when we go down to, to it, right, we could, and just playing a little bit of, of devil's advocate for uh, – the, the type of apologetics that we get is, uh, well, for example, as an Anglican, oh, King Henry VIII was the one who founded uh, your church. Well, I could say that about Constantine. Uh, it's the same <laughs> argument. It works the same way. Um, and and we, we would say, well, Martin Luther uh, was the one, or John Calvin. Well, I can say Thomas Aquinas founded Catholicism in many ways. If you actually just go down what actually boiled down to, like, Catholicism is Thomism, uh, you know, uh, or Greek or uh, Eastern Orthodoxy is Palamism. Then the German Church is is Lutheran. The the English, the Anglican Church is, is you know Catholic. Is, sorry, Reformed uh, as well. We, we can go along with these uh, things or Cr Cranmerism, if you want to call it that. Uh, uh, but, but you know what I mean? It's like we we could play these games because yes, there's these giant systematic theologians that run across but they help us understand the bible but we got to go back to the bible and i think that and to the apostolic teaching and that's very key word the apostolic teaching that not only is in the bible but you see it for example in the liturgy the apostolic teaching that you see in the nicene creed the apostolic teaching that you see in the Athanasian Creed. And, and, and you start seeing, once you start piecing together these things, right? You start piecing them together, things start becoming more clear, right? And um, in none of those do you see, uh, 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 you know, icon veneration, like what we eventually would see, uh, um, a federal episcopate, if you, if, as I'm using that term, right, that monarchical pope, uh, we don't see that. What we're seeing is, yes, there is an episcopacy, right? There, there is a type of apostolic succession, but what are we talking about? Well, the transmission of apostolic teaching, right? We, we are, we are, you know, there is an authority that is binding and loosing, okay? There is a level of authority that is granted, that is given, that is transmitted, okay? The teaching, here, here's the thing, I'm, I'm reading um, N.T. Wright right now, It's uh, and I don't agree on everything he says, particularly on justification, but on his historical analysis of the New Testament, like, I, I think everybody should be reading him. Um, um, he is somebody that a lot of people shy away from because they hear new perspective and they run away. Uh, but uh, he's really good, particularly in the historical side of things, right? 
Um, and when we get into like when anti rights starts get, get, getting into uh, the minutia of it, it's a kingdom and a kingdom and cross. That's 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 his whole thing, kingdom and cross, right? Um, if you focus on the um, kingdom, which is what we were talking about, kingdom is basically just doing good works and things like that, and, and that's you know that's great and everything, but you're missing the cross behind you. Now, if you focus only on the cross, you're focused only on the cross and you're narrowing it down on the cross and that's great, but you forgot the kingdom. You are, you are called to be part of a kingdom through a cross. So, uh, yeah. and, and these are things that, uh, when we look at the, 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 the apostolic, the rule of faith, the apostolic, uh, rule of faith, I, I, I just see, kingdom and cross throughout the whole thing and and showing uh my partiality although uh, you know a lot of people misunderstand calvin but you know covenant theology is all throughout the apostolic teaching so you know and, and that's something that a lot of people need to rescue more and understand more covenant theology too and yeah. so yeah so with that then uh, let me ask you here and this uh, this these two i'll put into one question and we can do it rapid fire uh, sure. Just because, I, I, man, I would love to stay and talk for way, way longer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this, uh, I have a friend I got to pick up from the airport soon. But when it comes to <laughs> the church fathers and Reformation authors, uh, rapid fire, who are a few uh, uh, fathers and Protestant authors? And, and if you know uh, maybe the names of specific works, even feel free to toss those in. And well, and for, you know, we'll do rapid fire now, but we can add some of these in the uh, book list. <laughs> yeah, be sure. the yeah, I, I was looking at we're like, well, wow, we're just having such a great time talking here that <laughs> yeah, me too. I was like, oh, Tom got away from me. But yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously, if we're just gonna pick, I, I'm gonna mention them, but I'm gonna mention these two first. Important. Just if you want to get a, a a complete feel, removing a bunch of inconsistencies and everything, and the best of the best. It's obvious, Athanasius and Augustine. Like it, it's just you can't go wrong with it. But on that, on these two, I would also add Jerome. Now, because Jerome has a very particular thing, is that Jerome is a Hebrew scholar, and that's you know the these are the, uh, Athanasius is a theologian and a you know very great thinker. Same thing with Augustine. But Jerome has that knowledge of Hebrew that actually is so interesting when he's making his commentary like his commentary on isaiah is something that that that, that for, for jerome's commentary on, on isaiah is oof, it's it's something that a lot of people need to see um and of course the apostolic fathers so uh, i would say read the apostolic fathers um and then read those three uh uh, uh athanasius augustine and jerome so, and then what about the reformers? Are there any reformers that you would uh, recommend to people? All of them. No, I'm joking. There, there, there's a lot of them that are very dry <laughs> sometimes. So, um, uh, Gearhart, obviously, like from that Luther, obviously, going to the sources, go look at Luther and Calvin, right? Uh, Cramer, Hooker, Jewell as the, the essential of Anglican. Hello. Uh, uh, the Anglican tradition. Uh, Mark Chemnitz, uh, also really good. Uh, um, John Owen is also re 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 uh, really good, too. Uh, uh, I just love him. And I'm not into the Puritan tradition too much, that I would say, but John Owen's pretty good overall. But I would say this to people, and I did uh, write this down, that if you ask me this question, that I would say this. Before you read uh, the, the, the Reformers, do yourself a favor. After you've read the Apostolic Fathers and those three fathers that I mentioned, which are titans, they're all, those three are doctors of the church, uh, of the Catholic Church, right? Read the 39 all articles, the Book of Homilies, which is the, the uh, Anglican Confessionals, uh, the Book of Concord, which is the Lutheran Confessionals, and then read the Westminster Standards and the Three Forms of Unity, which are the Calvinist Reform tradition, the Three Forms for the Continental, and then the Westminster for the uh, Scottish uh, Reform. 
do that. And the reason I'm telling you that is compare what you read from your Bible, from the Apostolic Fathers and those three giants of patristic tradition, and then compare what you see in, in those confessionals, which are just what the church actually believes, each church, and say to yourself, is this more consistent overall? It's not going to be 100% perfect. It's not because it, it never is, but you're going to be seeing, oh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of continuance here. That's on purpose. Cool. Uh, and so then as we as we come here toward the end, I have two final questions, and the ones that I always ask when I do interviews like this, right? So you ended up in the Anglican communion, right? And like you said at the beginning, you're actually even now trying to discern whether to become a pastor or a theologian, a teacher in service of, uh, you know, the, the Anglican church. And so... Why don't you unpack a little bit for us uh, how Anglicanism uh, is unique in relation to Roman Catholicism, like, you know, why you left Rome to become an Anglican? Uh, and then what about Anglicanism do you find to be unique in comparison with Lutheranism and, you know, evangelically, like with, just with, with the rest of the traditions under the Protestant umbrella? So I usually use um, uh, uh, the term Reformed Catholic because I think it's more apropos. I actually think Reformed Catholic uh, fits really well with both Lutheran and the Anglican tradition. I think it, 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 we use the term Anglicanism and Lutheranism because it's the historic name. But if we were actually being honest about what it actually implies, like it's Reformed Catholic, basically. We're taking the Catholic Church and reforming it back to its roots. So. Um, having said that, so yeah, I, I have a high sacramental view of baptism and the Eucharist. Now, um, I mentioned uh, at the beginning that I did change a little bit on the Eucharist, and I don't hold that trans transubstantiation uh, 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 view anymore. I, I believe in the real presence, obviously, uh, but I, I, I prefer keeping it a mystery of, of the real presence, uh, but still there, still very real. Um, but explaining how, like, if it's not in the Bible, I, <laughs> so keep it a mystery. Keep it a mystery. It's fine. Um, that, and um, at the same time, how do you keep that Catholic sacramental sacra sacramentology and keep that ecclesial body, right? So, because for me, it's obvious that we did have an episcopate. It is clear. It's there. It's You can't say, no, it didn't, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Uh, um, uh, but at the same time, recognizing uh, the five solas, the beauty and tradition of the Reformation. So obviously, like, you could be either Lutheran or Anglican, right? Bah, 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 bah. My thing came down that Anglicanism has a couple of things that I enjoy over Lutheranism, right? And it's that that zeal that I was talking about at the beginning of evangelicalism, like if you look at Anglicans, uh, Episcopalians, uh, uh, all of them, all of them in some form or another, um, they have this thing of kingdom and cross, which I've been mentioning before. There, there is uh, this view of going out to the world, not only preaching, but helping the world, right? Um, you see a bunch of Episcopal uh, uh, of charities and, and whatnot. You also have the cross, which is, you know, there was a great, great theologian, J.I. Packer, N.T. Wright. I mentioned a couple of the divines already, the Anglican divines. But you also, you know, N.T. Wright, you, not everybody agrees with him. Fine, but he's a great academic. He, he, <laughs> J.I. Packer, amazing as well. Um, C.S. Lewis, everybody usually forgets. Everybody wants to take C.S. Lewis. He's ours. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's, it's that openness, right? Uh, in, in necessaris unitas, in dubios libertas, in omnibus caritas, right? It's a unity in necessary things, freedom in doubtful things, and love in all things. And I think that's really well exemplified. In, in Anglicanism. That belief of lex orandi, lex credendi, the belief of prayer, is, sorry, the law of the prayer is the law of the believer, right? Well, we're praying in the Book of Common Prayer, right? Um, 
and it doesn't matter. I, I prefer this one, but it doesn't matter. Like the divine, uh, you know, the divine office every day, morning prayer, evening prayer. It's all based on the Bible, okay? And 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 you're just reading the Bible daily through prayer and uh, the prayers there, the Psalms in, in the Psaltery, right? Remind you of how to pray. They teach you how to pray. Um, I, I was seeing an interview from N.T. Wright years ago, and I didn't understand it until I started doing the, the, the Divine Office, right? My prayers became like the Psalms. And mm -hmm. I, as I kept doing the Divine Office, now I don't do it for my salvation. I do it because I want to have a relationship. That's a big key difference, too. I want to have a relationship. I'm not doing it to, to complete some mar marital work or anything like that. I want to get into that relationship with God. And um, as, as I kept going, um, I, when I pray on my own, I pray more like the Psalms. I can praise the Lord. That's, <laughs> um, that's the language you need to have. Uh, you know, the Psalms are pure in their emotion. When they're frustrated, they're frustrated. When the psalmist is frustrated, he's frustrated. When the psalmist is joyful, he's joyful. But he's pure about it. And he lets God participate in every single emotion. And and I, I think that's beautiful. And, and we need to recover. That's why I, I, even if you decide to become Lutheran, even if you decide to become uh, Calvinist, uh, more on the Scottish Reformed, because uh, Anglicans are Calvinists, technically. Um, uh, um, Scottish Reformed or, or Continental Reformed, like, just practice the divine, the, the divine office. So you, get, you just get immersed in it, because it's just the Bible and just prayers that the Lutherans like them. So we did something right. <laughs> and the one thing I would mention about <laughs> the Lutheran church, why I didn't join is that it's that closeness, actually going from that joke to, to they're so close. Uh, uh, you don't see a lot of Lutheran uh, 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 charities out there or, or missionaries. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean it disparagingly. I love my Lutheran brothers. I mentioned a great YouTuber who's amazing, who's doing great work for the kingdom, which is Dr. Jordan Cooper. Uh, but usually, and the Scholastic Lutherans, amazing group of individuals as well. But the problem is that for me, they sacrifice a little bit of the kingdom for the cross in that sense. And, and, and I would say that Anglicans have sometimes sacrificed a little bit of the cross for the kingdom, depending on what denomination you go to, sorry, on what side you go to. But uh, at the end of the day, I felt like it was, you know, keeping that reformed Catholic mindset that I wanted to, to, to search for. And at the same time, those extra little bits that got me well, thank you for sharing that. Again, I, I say this every time because I, I do find it fascinating. It's just, uh, I, I love the, the 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 different kind of reasonings and the heart behind uh, some of these decisions, right, for where people end up. Because sometimes people say, uh, "Hey, I'm reevaluating things." Like I, I mentioned, I will. I, have, I don't. I think I've mentioned it in passing in my channel, but like for myself, right, I've been raised Baptist. I was a Baptist associated youth pastor at my previous church, and I'm working at a Baptist church, but I'm also uh, reevaluating my own. Uh, uh, denominational convictions and trying to go back and saying, well, you know, what makes the most sense to me in light of scripture as I continue reading it and in light of all these other amazing <laughs> bodies of, of work, uh, theological work that I'm running into from the Reformation. And, and that's a process that I'm sure even for me will, will, will take some time. Uh, but I always love hearing from people why they ended up where they ended up. And so uh, my final question for you as we close out here is the same one I always ask everybody in these kind of interviews. And that is, what is the final word that you would like to give to two categories of people? One being uh, any Roman Catholics that may be listening and who are considering, maybe they're considering becoming Anglican or Presbyterian or Lutheran or what have you. They're, they're thinking of leaving the ecclesialist umbrella and joining a tradition in the Protestant umbrella. Or, uh, or what's the word that you would also give to a second group, any Protestants who may be listening, who are considering making the jump over to Rome? So I'll start with uh, my Catholic brethren uh, real quick, because I think that, you know, and I, I can only imagine right now how, how it's feeling, because I felt it too, uh, at some points, that, that frustration 
uh, that that you know the church that I picked is you know what it's wrong. Well, you know, God still loves you, <laughs> and and if you chose Christ, you know, He's still with you. And he, my my thing is, I didn't do an apologetics here for why uh, you should join uh, Protestantism. But I will say this. If some of the questions that we talked about here, uh, some of the, what well, Gavin Orland says, accretions, made you start thinking about things, going like, wow, I never thought about it like that. Uh, I never thought about this, that, or the other. Well, just start checking it out. And don't be afraid to question, okay? Because it, it, look, if you end up remaining Catholic, your faith will be will, will be stronger for it. Now, that's great, but I would I would hesitate in the sense that make sure that you put Christ first always in everything in everything. Which tradition is getting you closer to Christ? Which tradition is making you love the Lord more? Which tradition is keeping its roots, keeping its intellectual honesty, but at the same time reforming you? And I'm not I'm trying to uh, be uh, punny here, uh, you know, co converting you in every step that you make so you are light of the world, salt of the world. And to my Protestant brothers, I would say this look, I get it. I love the Bible too. I've been quoting the Bible throughout this whole video. But I've also quoted church fathers. I've also uh, quoted history. Um, it is important, okay, that, that we have we, we're educated in, in all of this, right? Um, as I was saying at the beginning, liturgy, which is what usually captures most people, literally, liturgy is not exclusive of Eastern Orthodoxy or the Coptic Church or the Roman Church. It is there in Anglicanism, it is there in Lutheranism, and those are Protestant, very Protestant, mind you. Um, you, you, know, you, you, would, you can also look into that beauty as well, if that's what worries you, right? If chaos is what, because that's one of the things, and I didn't mention it, but, uh, but if the ecclesial chaos of Protestantism uh, bothers you, I get it. I've been there, but are you going to be an old Catholic? Are you going to be a set of a contest? Are you going to be a rat trad? Are you going to be a glad trad? Are you going to be just a conservative uh, Catholic? Are you going to be an Eastern Catholic? Are you going to be a, uh, a Novus Ordo Catholic? Are you going to be a, a Father James Martin type of Catholic? And that's what I want to want to get across is that Catholicism also has a bunch of 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 umbrellas. It's an umbrella term for a bunch of other things too. Same thing in Protestantism. Okay, so you're not removing yourself from the decision process. You are still going to have to decide. You're still going to have to choose. And you're still going to have to face more hurdles. Now, here's the question that, that I have for you, uh, my, for my Protestant brothers who are thinking about this. Your defense is a defense of God, a defense of Jesus, uh, life and incarnation here, and a defense of the Bible. And if you could go through history, you can talk about the episcopacy and everything. But like everything that I summarize in Anglicanism, you can defend. But now, look at what Catholic apologists have to defend. Marian apparitions. They have to defend the papacy. And they have to add to their defense. Like, when I, was, when I went into an atheist time, let me put it to you this way. The historical, and we didn't talk about this here, but here's the one thing. The historical, act, the historicity of Jesus and his resurrection is so powerful that the only legitimate arguments that people make is that the apostles lied or they saw a vision. With the papacy, there's a billion arguments to be made. 
and with uh, these other things. So that's my final bit. Um, I, like I said, just uh, ponder these things uh, and, and in your heart, don't rush through things. Don't rush. And yes, seek theological wisdom, but start loving your neighbor too. So start loving God, get into prayer. Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, all of it. Pray, read the Bible, get involved in your church, submit to an actual priest or pastor, love thy neighbor. Thank you so much, Eddie. This has been a treat, as we can tell by uh, the time that you and I spent talking. And I would have talked more, too, if I... <laughs> it wasn't for those darn kids. No, if I didn't have to go pick up my friend from the airport, I will talk more. But uh, it's been an absolute treat uh, having you on. And again, Excellent. one final time for everyone at home. If you heard uh, things that Eddie said and you're like, oh, that was kind of fast. I didn't quite uh, catch this topic or that. Uh, we will have a reading list. Uh, and so Eddie will, I'm sure, will send me some good books. And if you guys want to check it out, again, that's why all these reading lists are free that I, that I put together. Uh, and while you're there, if you'd like to support the channel, uh, feel free to, to check out the locals and see if you'd like to support there. But thank you so much for coming on, Eddie. Is there anything else that you would like to say before we head out? Um, I can't plug anything because as a public school teacher, I'm, 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 no, and I'm thinking about creating my own, my own channel. Um, I, I'm still in the process of discerning it. Anyway, um, I'm probably going to be uh, writing a couple of things eventually since I just finished my master's and so now that I have the credentials, uh, you know, so I, I can flaunt them. I can put ma. It's, it's M-A, but I say ma next to my name. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, and hey, and if you ever start a channel or you, or you uh, uh, write a book and you publish it, I'll make sure to, after the fact, add the link down here in this video too. So awesome. thank you so much for coming on, brother, and we'll see you later.